fellow humans, and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast declared 100% virus-free by the World Health Organization. We somehow managed to find ourselves at the premiere episode of Season 11. What do we do here? Why, aside from maintaining a recommended safe distance, we find a theme, pick six movies based around that theme, and then we present those movies to you, our listening audience. We tell a little story about the movie, or something barely related to that movie, and then my oldest friend, Chad Cooper, and I, Bo Ranstell, walk you through the highlights of the movie, generally accompanied by some silly voices and at least one reference to a television show you don't remember. This season's theme is, we're all gonna die! I mean, that's true, but it also makes for an interesting collection of world gone mad movies. First up is the action blockbuster about diseased monkeys and a less diseased Dustin Hoffman. That's right, it's Outbreak, but I don't want to give anything away. Let's get to the show, and here's Chad to tell you all about the filthy, virus-infested world in which we live. Now where is that Lysol? In January of 1980, Charles Monet, a Frenchman, was living in western Kenya, and he decided to go explore Kittim Cave, a natural landmark located on a peak called Mount Elgin. A week later, he became seriously ill with a fever and vomiting, and things got so bad that he had to be flown to a hospital in Nairobi. So Monet, he's on this plane, and he's vomiting all over the place, and he gets to the hospital, and he just starts hemorrhaging, and he throws up blood and more vomit, some of which lands on Dr. Shim Musoki. Things didn't go too well for Monet because, well, he died. And then shortly thereafter, the unfortunate recipient of Monet's blood and puke, Dr. Musoki, well, he started getting sick. And all of Dr. Masoki's internal organs began to fail and his blood wouldn't clot. So Dr. Masoki's physician, Dr. Silverman, he sent a sample of Dr. Masoki's blood to a lab in South Africa and to the Center for Disease Control. The blood results came back and they said, congratulations, you have Marburg virus. You know, the virus that first broke out in a German factory in 1967 when workers were exposed to infected monkeys? Did you hear that noise? That's the sound of Bo's ears perking up and his eyes filling with anticipated excitement. See, it turns out that Marburg virus is pretty nasty and it kills one in four victims. It's a member of the phyloviruses, which includes two deadly diseases called Ebola Sudan, which kills half of its victims, and Ebola Zaire, which claims 90% of its victims. Maybe you've heard of them. They're kind of famous. Well, these two viruses, they attack every organ in your body, causing both massive bleeding and deadly blood clots. And kind of like AIDS, Marburg was passed to humans by monkeys. Also like AIDS, it generally only passes through direct contact with blood and other bodily fluids. You know, it kind of makes you think twice about laughing at those monkeys as they're throwing poo and semen at people at the zoo. Dr. Musoki, somehow he got better. And then some of his blood was sent to the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. If ever there was a setting for a Far Side cartoon, that is it. So let's jump ahead a few years to 1983, where Major Nancy Jacks, well, she's working at this laboratory, and she handles diseases that have no vaccine or cure with only the protection of, like, a spacesuit. It's a perfect job for anybody that needs an excuse to never hug a stranger. Now, at this time, George Johnson is a leading researcher on the Ebola virus, because most normal men are too dang scared to do this kind of work. And what exactly does this research involve? Well, he injects healthy monkeys with Ebola Zaire, and then he attempts to cure them. When it doesn't work out, it's Major Nancy Jax's job to dissect all these monkeys that, you know, were attempted to be saved, but were not. Well, one day, while prepping to cut up one of these dead monkeys, a co-worker notices that Major Nancy Jax's glove has a cut in it, and blood got inside two of the three layers of gloves she's wearing to protect herself. Now, luckily, Major Nancy Jax didn't get some of that Ebola on her, but this little episode leads to the discovery that Ebola, the illness that kills, you know, 50 to 90% of its victims, well, it turns out that it was able to mutate because it has become airborne. Don't worry, this story gets a whole lot worse. Major Nancy Jax, she got promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, good for her, and then she became the Chief of Pathology at the USAMRIID. 
flash forward to 1989 to the Reston Primate Quarantine Unit, home of Bo's future dream job, which is, in of all places, Reston, Virginia, a suburb of Washington, D.C. The Reston Primate Quarantine Unit stores monkeys that will soon be shipped to labs all across the U.S. for research or children's birthday parties. Here, an observant veterinarian, Dan Dalgard, he noticed that a surprising number of monkeys just started dying. And I'm guessing that has to be maybe three or four, because anything above that really needs more oversight. And it turns out there's this mysterious disease that is causing all of these monkeys to become dead. A couple of scientists examined some of the dead monkey cells, and they took a good sniff of the monkey culture, but it didn't smell like dead monkey to them, because it really had no smell. But it turned out that the culprit killing all the monkeys was a phylovirus. Remember the ones from that Ebola family tree? And these two scientists that sniffed the monkey culture, well, they got exposed. Lesson from this story, don't go sniffing monkey cultures. The powers that be said, hey, Go get me Nancy Jacks on the horn. And as a bunch of military bigwigs, they all got together and they decided that they should go and form the Pentagon and the Center for Disease Control. Stick with me. A team comes in and picks up the monkey cultures, as well as the corpses of those two guys who died from sniffing those monkey cultures, and then they all return back to the Institute. Nancy Jacks, she then begins to dissect the bodies of the dead guys that were sniffing the monkey cultures, and my guess is that cutting them up was a lot like her work with dead monkeys, only a lot bigger with less hair. Now about this time, a group of scientists and military brass, they all decided that the army is going to be in charge of euthanizing all of these infected monkeys. So a day later, and this is all a big secret, because, you know, they're going to go slaughter all of these death monkeys, and they don't want the press to find out and cause a mass panic among the public, hearing that there is a disease that people can catch that could kill everyone. Can you imagine that kind of thing happening in this day and age? And just like you see in the movies, these soldiers put on spacesuits and they began euthanizing all these infected monkeys, which is not that easy to do because these monkeys have really sharp teeth and they're infected with Ebola and most likely they probably don't want to die. Nancy Jack starts dissecting the destroyed bodies of this second round of monkeys and this guy working at the monkey house, Milton Frantic, he just starts puking. So off to the ambulance you go. But then on the second day of this monkey side, you're never going to believe what happened. One of these monkeys escaped, but the next day they caught it, and then they killed it, along with every other living creature in the monkey house. So having run out of these monkeys, the scientist ordered another batch of fresh monkeys, and you are never going to guess what happened next. Another wave of Ebola sweeps through the monkey house, exposing more employees to the virus, but it turns out all these people getting exposed, they're not getting sick. So this time, the army says, you know what, we're just going to let this group of monkeys die out the way God intended, since the virus poses little threat to humans. But are you ready for the twist in the story? It turns out that these people getting exposed didn't get initially sick. The virus stayed in their bodies and they had no symptoms, but it could travel through the air. And wouldn't you know it, a new version of Ebola emerged. Ebola Reston, named after the monkey house. Now, it didn't affect humans, but a tiny change in its genetic code could make this virus deadly to all of humanity. Now, about this time, researchers figured out that Kittim Cave was the source of all this trouble, and a group of researchers went down there, and one guy went inside, and he came out all freaked out because he thought that he might have the Marburg virus. Remember the thing that started this whole mess? And these researchers finally concluded that maybe there is some kind of link between Ebola and HIV and the human destruction of biospheres on Earth. They theorized that maybe these viruses were a way that nature's immune system was attacking the parasitic infection of humanity. They also speculated that more deadly diseases may emerge to kill off even more humans. The end. You know what? That story never got any better. But the good news is, it's just that. It's a story. It's a non-fiction story that's based on 100% true events. And what story is that I mostly kind of sort of got accurate? Well, it's none other than Richard Preston's 1994 summertime beach book page turner, The Hot Zone. And I know what you're thinking. How could a feel-good classic like that not be turned into a major motion picture? Well, I'll tell you what, it wasn't for people not trying. 
See, back in January of 93, 20th Century Fox producer Linda Opst won a bidding war for the film rights to an article that Preston wrote in The New Yorker back in 1992, which was still being turned into the longer book, The Hot Zone. Over at Warner Brothers, though, producer Arnold Coppelson, he started working on an almost identically themed movie. The competing film is, you guessed it, Outbreak. And this movie was only loosely somewhat kind of inspired by Preston's initial article and the forthcoming book. When Linda Ops was looking to find a director to helm her adaptation of The Hot Zone, she took a gander at Michael Mann and Ridley Scott and Wolfgang Peterson, who would later go on to direct Outbreak. Screenwriter James V. Hart was also signed on to adapt the book to the silver screen. Hart, of course, adapted screenplays based on literary classics including Bram Stoker's Dracula and Muppet Treasure Island. And in April of 1994, Fox announced that they had signed Robert Redford and Jodie Foster to star in the film adaptation Crisis in the Hot Zone. But Foster dropped out of the movie before filming was to begin, and then production got delayed. In August, Robert Redford also dropped out of the film, and then a few days after he left, it was announced that pre-production had been shut down. But over on the Warner Brothers lot, things were just starting to crank up. Sure, Linda Opps 100% blamed the production of Outbreak as the reason her adaptation of The Hot Zone was halted. Linda Opp said her movie had a better script and even said that Outbreak director Wolfgang Peterson tried to get Robert Redford to switch teams and star in Outbreak instead of starring in their adaptation of The Hot Zone. How do you like that? This Hollywood place sounds like it might be full of some real scoundrels. At this time, Wolfgang Peterson was coming off his critically acclaimed submarine film, Das Boot, as well as directing The Never Ending Story and Enemy Mine. That's right, you forgot Wolfgang Peterson directed all three of those movies. Now, rumor has it that Peterson tried to enlist Harrison Ford to star in Outbreak, but that fell through. But don't worry, the two of them teamed up a few years later for Air Force One. It was also rumored that Mel Gibson and Sylvester Stallone were both considered as the handsome leading action hero of this movie. But after they passed on the starring role, the movie's heroic, charming, super smart scientist action and adventure all around man about town went to the obvious next choice, Dustin Hoffman? Now look, Dustin Hoffman is one of the greatest American actors of all time. From his breakout performance in 1967's The Graduate to Midnight Cowboy, his performance as the troubled comedian Lenny Bruce in the autobiographical film Lenny is unbelievable. Hoffman delivered a comedic tour de force in Tootsie. He's got two Oscars, one for Kramer vs. Kramer and another for Rain Man. Death of a Salesman, All the President's Men, Marathon Man, and not to mention those Kung Fu Panda movies. He is a national treasure. But as an action movie star? Maybe not so much. But we kind of need to stop right here and ask a question. Is Outbreak an action movie? Well, kind of. Is it a thriller? Mostly. Does it have comedy? It tries. Romance? I think so. It, it's all this and more, more or less. But you know what? Let's wait for Bo to get here and we'll discuss all of that with our own personal brand of Pick 6 Movies goofery. More legitimate than us two knuckleheads and certainly more famed movie critic Roger Ebert described the movie Outbreak as a clever, daunting thriller. Ebert went on to describe the movie's plot as detailing the career of a microscopic bug that kills humans within 24 hours of exposure by liquefying their internal organs. Not a pretty picture. The bug is based on fact, an account something similar can be found in Richard Preston's new book, The Hot Zone. You know, that's the kind of review mentioning The Hot Zone by name that really twisted the knife in the belly of film producer Linda Opst. Outbreak came out on March 10th, 1995, and it was number one at the box office, beating out Pulp Fiction and Forrest Gump. But keep in mind, these movies had been in the theater for 22 weeks and 36 weeks, respectively. The number two movie that week was Man of the House, starring Jonathan Taylor Thomas and Chevy Chase. And the numbers bear out that twice as many people went to see a movie about a virus that eats you from the inside out over a family-friendly comedy starring a notoriously unlikable comedian and an aging teen heartthrob. 
And it's not hard to see why people were drawn to the movie Outbreak, because it had superstar power in almost every performance. Let's run down the list. Dustin Hoffman, we've already mentioned him. Morgan Freeman shows up to play a military officer. Freeman was fresh off starring in The Shawshank Redemption, where he received his third Oscar nomination. It would be a few years later when he eventually took home his statuette for Million Dollar Baby. Kevin Spacey plays a peer scientist to Dustin Hoffman. Little did audiences know that about a year later, Spacey would play Verbal Kent in The Usual Suspects, where he would take home his first of two Oscars. The latter Oscar would be given to him for his role in American Beauty. Now, fun fact, The Usual Suspects was the big screen directorial debut of Brian Singer. I'll bet Singer and Spacey had some real interesting conversations on the set of that movie. Cuba Gooding Jr. plays a young medical professional who would later win an Oscar for his role as a football player that likes to air dry after taking showers in Jerry Maguire. Donald Sutherland plays the asshole in the movie, and he got an honorary Oscar in 2017. And I know, I know, it's not the same as a regular Oscar, but do you have an Oscar? No? Then shut up! Rene Russo is in the movie, and at the time, she was on a roll of starring roles, landing herself in Lethal Weapon 3 alongside Mel Gibson, and then alongside Clint Eastwood in In the Line of Fire. Patrick Dempsey, who apparently is a real big deal on the ABC sexy doctor show Grey's Anatomy, well, he's in this movie. Now, at this time in his career, Dempsey's most memorable performance for me was that of Rudy in Meatballs 3, where the ghost of a dead porn star comes to Earth to help a nerd with his sex life. Now, just to clarify, the dead porn star ghost is played by Sally Kellerman, who was the original Hot Lips Houlihan in Robert Altman's brilliant film, M.A.S.H., and even that monkey that played Marcel in the hit 90s NBC sitcom Friends shows up in this movie as the source of the deadly virus. Another fun fact, Marcel the monkey was actually played by a female white-headed capuchin monkey named Katie. And the practice of female monkeys playing male monkey characters is a common practice that goes all the way back to monkey stage productions of the plays of Monkey Shakespeare. Where were we? Outbreak. Outbreak wasn't just the number one movie when it came out. It remained at the top of the box office for three straight weeks, ultimately handing over the crown of number one movie in America to a fat man in a little coat known as Tommy Boy. Now, just because Outbreak began its slow slide down Mount box office, the popularity of virus movies and pandemic films didn't slow down over the coming years. Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys, Eli Roth's Cabin Fever, there were all those Resident Evil movies, 28 Days Later, 28 Weeks Later, that whole Planet of the Apes reboot, World War Z, Contagion. As each of these films landed in theaters, thwarted film producer Linda Obst stood on the sidelines knowing that she had a better project on her hands, but she couldn't get it into production. In an interview with Variety magazine, Linda Obst said she watched virus movie after virus movie come out and felt like they were all offshoots of the Preston bestseller, The Hot Zone. Ops said in the interview, every time one hit the screen, I wanted to bang my head against the wall. She eventually found herself talking to David Madden, who was at Fox at the time, and they began developing a miniseries that finally found a home at the cable network Nat Geo. Juliana Margulies was cast as the aforementioned protagonist Nancy Jax, and the series eventually debuted in 2019. And it was a real critical success. Currently has an 85% freshness rating over at Rotten Tomatoes. And sure, it took 20 years, but finally, the source material was given an honest adaptation that didn't include high-speed helicopter chases and adorable dogs and taxi cabs. Or maybe it did, because I never saw it. But you know what movie I did see that does have high-speed helicopter chases and adorable dogs and taxi cabs? That's right the subject of this very episode. So without any further delay, ladies and germs, bugs and girls, I give you the Oscar award-winning actor-filled film from 1995, Outbreak. <laughs> And welcome to Pick 6 Movies Season 11. We're all gonna die! Never has it been more true. 
I am here with my lovely, brave, resilient, hand-washing co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? I am on TikTok. I am licking doorknobs and toilet seats Mm -hmm. and other people. Yes. And a pair of dogs in a taxi cab. I lick everything I can get my tongue on. And that is different how? Not at all. I just, I'm living my best life, Chad, and I continue to do so. (laughs) You know, when I see those spring breakers on on the television, Chad, Mm -hmm. uh, talking about how, hey, look, whatever happens, happens. What I, what I say to myself, Chad, is I know, I know how you're living. You know me, Chad. Yes. You can't keep me off a beach. (laughs) I'm a, a beach whale, they call me, Chad, because of how much I love the beach. Or, wait, maybe not. <laughs> Fuck those guys. How are you? How are you? How are you holding up in the apocalypse? I'm uh, I'm I'm quarantined. I've got all the essentials. I have beer. But I'm doing great, Bo. Yeah, I got myself a little quarantini myself. <laughs> So as noted at the end of season 10, this was not our plan season 11. Our plan season 11 is going to come at the end of the year, assuming that we're all still alive. Yeah. But then we took up this season, which was going to come much farther in the future. We pulled it up because these are crazy times and we needed to address the issues of the day. Issues that involve pandemics, that involve circumstances where lots of people all die at the same time. Because we know that you're worried about that, and we wanted to make light of very serious situations in the real world. There is nothing that says humanity like looking at a, a, a real credible threat and mocking it. Yes! So I'm excited to be part of this. <laughs> Let's jump into it. Our movie starts proper. With a quote. It's fancy. It is. We get a quote from Nobel, excuse me, we get a quote from Nobel Laureate Joshua Ledberg, PhD. Yeah, I went to school with Nobel Laureate, I think. (laughs) That reads, the single best threat to man's continued dominance on the planet is the virus. And I got to tell you both, I would have said outer space aliens or sentient robots. Or willfully ignorant people who vote against their own self-interest. I never would have thought that the Jamie Lee Curtis film Virus would have been the biggest threat to man's continued dominance on the planet. (laughs) Yet here we are. Our movie starts off and we are in the idyllic jungle of Africa. Or maybe it's North Carolina. We don't know yet. And there's all kinds of explosions that are happening. And right away, we are in a war zone. Mm -hmm. So my money is on Africa over North Carolina at this point. Sure. And the very first living creature we see in this movie is a screaming monkey. You love that, didn't you, Bo? Look, for about 30 minutes, I think this movie's going to be okay. And then the monkey disappears. (laughs) He comes back later. Yeah, so Marcel the monkey Mm -hmm. from Friends, Mm -hmm. uh, he's real upset because this war's happening right in his jungle there's something the whole like the first 10 minutes of this movie are like the first 20 minutes of the movie predator there's a you know (laughs) with the virus over there sorry (laughs) where like i just kept expecting like dutch to pick up a truck and (laughs) shove it towards somebody while the monkey's watching Well, we get a title card that lets us know the year is 1967. Um, We're in the month of July, and we are in the Motaba River Valley, Zaire, and we're at this mercenary camp. Sounds awful to me. Yeah, that does seem like a real shithole country, right? (laughs) The soldiers in this scene, they've whipped up these uh, makeshift medical hospitals under thatched roofs, and inside are all of these injured or sick people. And then a helicopter lands, and two men jump out, and they're wearing these green hazmat suits. And so we go back inside the tent, and we scan over all of the soldiers, and they've got all these red blotches on their skin and sores on their faces. And there's this local African doctor who says, we don't know why these guys are dying and we need supplies right because we can't de-age morgan freeman and donald sutherland we didn't have the technology in 1995 to do that so (laughs) instead they're just in suits that cover their faces and you just hear donald sutherland talking you hear donald sutherland whispering donald sutherland who you don't see like i'm saying it's donald sutherland but it could be any it could have been me but it sounds like donald sutherland it does sound like donald sutherland and he runs across the kid from salem's lot danny all grown up oh right uh, when i saw him i was like where do i know him from and i had to do the homework 
which turned into me watching Salem's Lot. Um, <laughs> it's a great movie. But the Salem's Lot kid all grown up is like, oh, I don't want to die here. I want to go see my wife and my family. And Don Southern is just like, um, no, no. Um, I'm afraid that you're, uh, you're probably just going to die right here uh, because of all the disease. So best of luck. See, I took it that he looked at the kid and he said, you know what? We've got you covered. We just need to get some of your infected blood and then we'll get you back to Cleveland or Milwaukee or Toledo or wherever it is you come from. You'll, you'll see that girlfriend of yours. I, I pinky promise. Nope. Nope. Don't, don't touch my pinky. (laughs) Nope. 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 And then he, after he draws some blood out of this kid, he and Morgan Freeman, who, again, you do not see, but he calls him Billy at one point, which is how you know it's supposed to be Morgan Freeman. This movie really sucks at connecting a lot of dots. Having watched this multiple times, it was at the very end of the scene. I was like, oh, wait, that's Donald Sutherland and Morgan Freeman. Mm-hmm. And I was really paying attention. <laughs> yeah, it's not like the other movies we watched. So they leave the tent and this local doctor, he takes the two mystery men in the green hazmat suits outside and he he shows them this pile of rotting corpses and this movie really pulls its punches here because we the audience don't get to see all of the rotting faces of these dead people we only get to see it reflecting in the mask of the the hazmat suit and this movie is rated r and it's only rated r because i say fuck maybe four times there's nothing else in this film that should have not garnered a pg-13 rating donald sutherland in his hazmat suit he says Uh, We'll help you out in any way possible. And I'm going to authorize an immediate airdrop, doctor. And the doctor looks at it and he's like, oh, great. We can use whatever medical supplies you can provide. And um, why did you put air quotes when you said the word airdrop? And then Donald Sutherland says, oh, that's just something I do when I'm talking about a village not being blown up by a giant bomb that's disguised as a medical supply drop yeah but later we get the updated version of this bomb which is the same bomb with a couple of r2d2 things on it which is pretty funny but yeah so sutherland um is just like billy how about you uh you get your ass in the plane and we're gonna get the fuck out of here um best of luck everybody here in the village see you later uh Take it sleazy. Yeah, cut to sometime later, and all these soldiers, well, the ones that aren't bedridden and covered in sores and open wounds, and all the mostly healthy ones, they all come outside with the village doctor and a couple of locals, and there's this plane flying in the air as it prepares to drop much-needed medical supplies to help save these people's lives. And, Boat, not since those cuckoo brains in Independence Day gathered on the rooftops in New York City have I seen faces go from excited anticipation to, oh, shit, we're we're going to die right now so quickly. Yeah, it, there is that the mask of, of joy and hope falls away and it's just a, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> this plane opens up its bomber door and attached to a parachute and it just comes down and hits the ground and it's like an atomic bomb. It melts people, cars, shacks, everything. And as this fireball explodes in a mushroom cloud of white smoke, we see the name Dustin Hoffman on the screen. And if you didn't know he was in this movie you're let's say you're just watching it blind it would be a real shocker of a name to see appear on the screen i'm thinking maybe like carrot top or Polly shore would be the only names that would cause you to tilt your head more to the side compared to dustin hoffman i've got one other paul sorvino <laughs> would have would have stopped me dead I'm like paul sorvino is headlining this movie about an african village getting bombed is mira in it <laughs> like warwick davis <laughs> Warwick Davis, Peter Cushing, Gary Coleman, (laughs) Gary Coleman and Emmanuel Lewis in the movie You Can't Miss. (laughs) It's called Short Break. Well, the title credits continue, and we see Rene Russo's name, followed by Morgan Freeman. And then we get to see the jungle, and it's on fire from the bomb blowing up. And then a troop of monkeys runs along a branch, and we get the movie's title, Outbreak. And then another title card comes up and says, Present Day, which is really the year 1995, so it's in the past. And we then get a card that says, U.S. AMRID, which I mentioned during the opening of the show, and that's the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, and we're at Fort Detrick, Maryland. 
Yeah, I can't even see the screen for this insert, Chad. No, it's a lot. And the other thing this movie does that's really stupid is that it mixes together title cards that give us information about the movie while it's also showing us the credits of the production crew at the same time. And ain't nobody reading the production crew credits. I've said this on the show before. No one cares about those credits. But when you sort of mix them in with really important information, I don't know what to read and what not to read. So I ain't reading nothing. (laughs) Yeah, the production designer is in Maryland? When did that happen? (laughs) The names of the movie stars all show up in a particular order and we see Patrick Dempsey's name and he gets top billing over Kevin Spacey. And in fact, Kevin Spacey gets a good old fashioned and Kevin Spacey in this movie. He wouldn't get any billing in a movie right now, Bo. (laughs) No, I mean, unless you're looking at court TV footage, (laughs) but the with and the and is always that little like, oh, well, they're not in this movie a lot, but they got paid more than the other people who weren't in the movie a lot. (laughs) And probably Kevin Spacey got his pick of monkeys and or extras. This movie spoon feeds us the four levels of this research institute. Level one is for low risk work like pneumonia and salmonella. We know this because it's splashed up on the screen. And the doctors in this unit, they're all wearing like normal doctor lab coats like you see at, I don't know, like a Quest Diagnostic or maybe some guy, you know, wanting to give you a free chiropractic exam. (laughs) Right. Somebody with a clipboard in one of those middle areas in the mall, like one of those booths they got set up. Right. That wants to tell you all about foot fungus. Maybe a cosmetics counter, that sort of thing. I, before we descend into the the other levels, Chad, Mm -hmm. did you notice the music cues for each level? Level two goes bum, 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 bum. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> like, like the drums really kick in just well level two is hepatitis and lyme disease and the doctors in this area they're wearing lab coats and they're wearing the face masks that you can strap on with the little rubber bands i just want to note level one is right next door to level two and i didn't see a whole lot of closed doors to separate these areas and i was like this is kind of like old school smoking and non-smoking sections on airplanes and restaurants right it's just like eh, it'll be fine We'll draw a curtain. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, yeah, germs can't even get through that. They can't get through a curtain. Not these. These are level two germs. They can't do shit. Also, did you notice in each of the levels, when someone leaves to progress to the next level, before they leave their level, they just take off their protective breathing gear, which was like, I don't think this place is really that dangerous. So we make our way to level three, and this is the high biohazard room. And everybody here is dressed head to toe in one of those zip up onesies. And it looks like they all work in the Willy Wonka TV studio. And this is where they study anthrax and HIV. And the researchers here all have on those air filtration masks yeah and no music at all on this level they're just like oh fuck that we got too much there's serious business afoot we can't be screwing around with drums and trumpets and shit no not at all we finally reach level four and this is a lab that requires both a pin number on a keypad and a scanning of your fingerprints to get inside and in level four it's totally full of monkeys which is why they have the dual authentication of the pin number and the fingerprints because otherwise everybody would be going there hanging out to see all kinds of monkey hide jinx playing tic-tac-toe with them feeding them bananas we get our first sighting of kevin spacey in this movie who is prepping an empty suit and kind of groping it you know for practice (laughs) and and then we see dustin hoffman action star dustin hoffman Mm -hmm. and renee russo suited up and we finally have somebody talk in this movie. Not just a screaming monkey. Right. It turns out they're kind of chit-chatting about, uh, it, it's Rene Russo's last day on the job as they're going through some airlocks. Yeah, like Dustin that. Hoffman asks her, he says, this is definitely your last day. Definitely, definitely your last day. And she's like, yeah, it's, it's my last day. And I'm thinking, look, there are even odds right now she's going to die in this movie, or at the very least, she's going to roll her eyes and say, I am too old for this shit. I would love this movie so much if she loved left it for the thomas crown affair (laughs) if she was like look i know you guys are dealing with a virus or some shit but i'm gonna go be in this way better more interesting movie uh that doesn't happen though let's be honest renee russo would never say i'm too old for this shit because as a working actress in hollywood every role is an attempt to prove to casting directors that you are in fact not too old for this shit yeah you can tell that renee russo is too old for this shit because she's not in movies anymore (laughs) 
<laughs> we end that scene and we leave the lab and we immediately go to Dustin Hoffman's house where he's washing his two dogs and being a very loving pet owner. And Bo, we like this guy. He's kind to dogs. If I see him drink a beer later and separately be kind to a small child, he wins the movie trifecta of good guy characters. I've got a question for you, Chad. Uh-huh. What in the fuck is the outfit he's wearing? He looks like he is practicing to be an extra in an MC Hammer video. Well, it was the 90s. I guess, but it's like the, these breezy shorts and this torn ass t-shirt. It's his dog washing outfit. Do you have just a, a special tattered outfit just for dog washing? I wash my dog in the nude. You know, as with most things that you do. <laughs> which it, you have a very liberal approach to clothes in your household, which is one of the reasons I like to visit. It's one of the reasons you like to leave. Look, even before this whole COVID-19 thing, mm-hmm. I was packing a lot of Lysol with me. I know. The phone rings at Dustin Hoffman's house and it's Morgan Freeman. And he says, Dustin Hoffman, are you there? It is me, Morgan Freeman. And so Dustin Hoffman picks up the phone and Morgan Freeman says, we've got a level four in ear. You are working the level four lab. I need you there as quickly as possible. I'm Morgan Freeman. And so (laughs) Dustin Hoffman asks a bunch of questions like, how many are dead? Is it really gross? Can I put together a team? One team or two teams? One for bad, two for good? And Morgan Freeman says, get on the plane, Dustin Hoffman. I'll explain later. But this is as big as it gets. I'm Morgan Freeman. He hangs up the phone and there's what passes for comedy in this movie. This movie shifts tones. It's almost manic. As to what the hell is going on in this film. Yeah. So after hanging up uh, this call with Morgan Freeman about a deadly virus, he then looks to his dogs who are wet on the couch. One of them's wearing a towel, Bo. <laughs> yeah, on its head. It's all done up, all beehive style, you know. <laughs> and Dustin Hoffman's like, yeah, which of you disobeyed me first? It was Lewis. Definitely Lewis. And I love when someone has human names for their pets. It is one of my favorite things. I, I, I so dearly want a dog named Greg, and I just don't have one yet. <laughs> so he takes these stupid dogs to Rene Russo, and she's like, are you here to get all your stuff? Because she's clearly moving out. She's, she's packing up her house. Yeah, our house has been sold. We see a for sale sign in the yard. Yeah, and he says, yeah, I'm going to Zaire. Definitely going to Zaire. And uh, she's like, oh yeah, is everybody going? And he's like, yeah, the whole the whole crew is going. Uh, and most of it. You're not going. That's not the whole crew. But are they boyfriend, girlfriend? Are they colleagues? Are they brother, sister? Are they husband, wife? You don't know any of this. No, it turns out they were married. But I don't think I knew that until the last scene of this movie. When I was like, <laughs> oh, they were married? I thought they were just dating. I thought they dated. They went out twice and then it got weird. So we know that they dated for at least a little while because he says, yeah, this is this is definitely my coffee mug. I'm going to take this now. She's like, yeah, yeah, take the fucking coffee mug. I got a whole box of your shit in this living room and I need you to take it out of here. And he goes to the box and he's about to grab it. And then he realizes that all the photographs of them, of he and Rene Russo, are in this box and to, to be thrown out. And he's like, You're, you, these are all the pictures of, of us. Definitely all the pictures of us. She says, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't want them anymore. You can keep them. Then he says, well, I, then I don't want them either. And then he just tosses everything back in the box and leaves with the one mug that he grabbed off the shelf, <laughs> which I like just on principle of just like, fuck all that shit. I, this mug. I need this mug. This, <laughs> this cat statue. And that's it. It's all I need. And this paddle ball game. And that's all I need. This mug, this cat statue, and this paddle ball game. And the remote. And these dogs. And I need you too, Lewis. All right, maybe I don't need Lewis. Yeah, it's so dumb. And so he just leaves. Then he goes to meet with Casey, a.k.a. Kevin Spacey, Mm -hmm. where they're getting the plane ready to take off to go to Zaire. Kevin Spacey tells him, like, hey, where's so-and-so? And And he's like, "Eh, I don't know uh, where that guy is. Uh, We've got a new guy who is Cuba Gooding Jr., Mm-hmm. Dustin Hoffman then is like, all right, fine. What, whatever the fuck Cuba Gooding Jr. is doing in this movie, fine. I need to go talk to Morgan Freeman, the only other real actor in this movie. He goes to the tarmac where Freeman is hanging out, and he's like, uh, hey, what, do you, what are you doing here? And Morgan Freeman is like, well, I thought this one star on my shoulder would speed things up. I'm Morgan Freeman. He says, look, Dustin Hoffman, what I need you to do is get in and get out. 
I don't want to lose you to some bug in the field. And then there is an exchange, Chad, that I still do not understand. Okay, I'll explain it to you. Please do. Dustin Hoffman says, yeah, what did I do to deserve this? And Morgan Freeman says, you got up this morning, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I can explain. It's bad writing. What is their relationship? Are they actually antagonistic towards one another? Because I don't... I think they're married. Or they dated. (laughs) They're... Here you go, Dustin Hoffman. Here's a box of pictures of us with our cats you know i'm allergic to dogs <laughs> i definitely don't want them definitely don't want them do you have my coffee mug it matches this one here's a coffee mug that says world's greatest autistic <laughs> yet yeah, definitely my cup everybody gets in this plane and it takes off to zaire and here we get to meet kuba gooding jr for the first time proper and kevin spacey he's kind of laying around and he's eating a candy bar and he's listening to rock and roll music on his walkman and kuba gooding jr doesn't care for kevin spacey's lazy attitude and dustin hoffman shows up to give us a bunch of exposition that kuba gooding jr is a medical professional and he's also a helicopter pilot that's so that later in the movie you can't call bullshit when he goes full airwolf in the film <laughs> and spacey is kind of giving Cuba Gooding Jr. shit. He's like, have you ever dealt with a hemorrhagic fever and that kind of thing? Kevin Spacey says like, hey, allow me to describe what happens. Well, first, you know, your face starts to get covered in pustules and you get red and puffy and Cuba Gooding Jr. then kind of interrupts and gives the textbook answer right he says sir yes sir the eyes begin to hemorrhage and convulsions begin to happen there's more internal hemorrhaging complicated by internal organs shutting down along with symptoms including something that some people consider to be funny but it is really hot and runny diarrhea (coughs) diarrhea (coughs) sir yes sir and then kevin spacey is like but what about when you're going down the hall and you hear something fall (coughs) now i'm sure you think you're prepared but wait till you see it. Dustin Hoffman chimes in and he says, look, that's all well a good major, but in about 16 hours, you're about to see it face to face. And when we land in Zaire, you are going to be witness to people walking up and putting their feet on the floor as they make a 50 yard dash to the bathroom door. That's diarrhea. (coughs) Diarrhea. (coughs) Wait a second. We're getting a call for Morgan Freeman. It's for you, Cuba Gooding Jr. (laughs) Just wanted to say there's a real strong chance. (laughs) (laughs) i'm sorry i got myself tickled there's a real good chance when you (laughs) do you want me to do it please i can't get it out (laughs) there's a real strong chance hold on all right let me take one more stab at it when you're sliding into third you're going to feel a juicy turd i'm morgan freeman and if you're climbing up a ladder And you hear something splatter. That too is probably diarrhea. What this has proven to me, Chad, is there is no amount of money I wouldn't pay to hear Morgan Freeman do every (laughs) shitty verse of that. When you're sliding into home and your pants are full of foam. (laughs) Diarrhea. (laughs) I'm Morgan Freeman. Uh, (laughs) Cooper Gooding Jr. says, sir, yes, sir, I can handle it, sir. The one thing I certainly won't do, sir, is throw up inside my oversized movie star hazmat helmet with 180 degree face visibility, sir. (laughs) And so we we see two helicopters land in Zaire and it pretty much looks like the same place where the movie started. I think it is, but maybe not. And we're now 30 years later or whatever. And up on the mountain, there's this voodoo priest and he's kind of getting over this wicked ayahuasca trip. (laughs) And he don't matter. We'll mention him in, but it doesn't come to anything. The choppers land and our three movie stars all pile out of the helicopters and they're all dressed like Marty McFly after he arrived for the first time in 1955. It's full head to toe yellow hazmat suit. They're just missing the hair dryer Vulcan hand sign and Darth Vader alias. And they would all clearly take home first prize in a very niche cosplay contest. And 201 Huey Lewis thinks they're too darn loud. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and we can see their faces because it's actually them this time and not Donald Sutherland and a young Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Bodies are just lined up on the ground. Then they pass what used to, it looks like it used to be a house where they just threw a bunch of bodies and set them on fire. Mm -hmm. And so we get kind of a charred skeleton and stuff like that. Like shit clearly went down in this village. Clever Kevin Spacey says, hey, I think that one hut over there, the one that's not burning, that's the one we should go investigate. You think? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Dustin Dustin Hoffman is like, I'm definitely glad you came along. 
So they go into this hospital, a.k.a. the shack where the sick people are, and most of them are dead already. <laughs> Isn't that what a hospital is? Just a shack with sick people? That could also be a, you know, a flop house with a bunch of junkies. I mean, either way, you're having a good time, Chad. <laughs> you're going to get your hands on some sweet, sweet opiates. <laughs> And so Cuba Gooding Jr. starts poking around this place, and most of the patients are dead. And then he finds this sick, diseased kid sitting on a bed in between the kid's dead parents. Right. And this is where Cuba Gooding Jr. loses his shit and starts getting sick and thrown up inside his helmet. He's trying to pull the helmet off. Meanwhile, Kevin Spacey and Dustin Hoffman are both like, what the fuck are you doing? Did you not see all the dead people on the way in? Please do not take off your helmet or you will be one of them it does seem like a big miss <laughs> yes uh he takes it off and then the local doctor comes in and he's like don't worry he will not die it's not airborne and then he explains like the entire village is pretty much dead at this point the doctor of this village is like lose your friends for a second dustin hoffman come to her with me and they kind of walk around the village and the doctor is telling them that there was some guy who went to help the white men walk of the jungle or whatever or like cut down uh trees in the jungle whatever you call that i guess it's logging deforesting when he came back he was sick and then he drank from this community well uh-huh and then everybody got sick and fucking died right the doctor says the mortality rate of this disease is a hundred percent okay and dustin hoffman is like yeah did did anybody leave that seems like it'd be real bad if everybody left and he's like, no, no, no. If anybody left, they're either dead already or they are dying in the jungle because this thing moves so fast mm -hmm. that you there's just no time. Like, you would never make it to civilization. It's 50 miles anywhere from this village, and you're never going to make it with this disease. So it's contained. Hoffman asks him, what about that witch doctor up on the hill there? The one who's singing Hasadiga Ibawai and giving the finger up to the sky. What about him? And then the African doctor, he says, oh, him, he's a juju doctor. He thinks that the virus is a punishment from the gods for cutting down the trees. He also drinks his own pee-pee. Dustin Hoffman's like, yeah, that's definitely stupid. Definitely not science. We're going to leave. And so sure enough, they do. They just get in the chopper and fuck off. Right. While Marcel the monkey and, and this medicine man watch him go. Right. And, you know, end of movie. Uh, so, Chad, <laughs> on the next episode. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There's more. Oh, shit. Back on the plane, Dustin Hoffman is dictating an email to Kevin Spacey until you hear Dustin Hoffman say, tell him, tell him it's serious and fax that over to Morgan Freeman's house. And then you as the audience realize, oh, shit, wait, that's not a laptop. That's a portable word processor. And that you've somehow time traveled to a place where the world as we know it isn't. The only thing I, I kind of like about this exchange is when Dustin Hoffman is like, tell him, tell him it's frightening. Tell him it's frightening. Kevin Spacey is like, no, that's that's an adverb, and the adverb is a tool of a lazy mind. And I think that's a funny line. There's exactly one thing I like about... The, or No, let me take that back. There are exactly two things I like about this movie. That line... Th I take that back. There are three things I like about this movie, Chad. That line, the monkeys, and a moment to be named later. You know what? I'm going to be so happy if the moment to be named later is my favorite moment in this movie, too. I think there's a good <laughs> chance it might be. I, there's only one other thing in the movie that's kind of wonderful, and we'll get to it. Does it involve a centrifuge? No, it does not. Shit. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get to it. So when he leaves, uh, or Dustin Hoffman kind of wraps things up with Kevin Spacey, and then he goes to check on Cuba Gooding Jr., who is like hey i'm sorry back there i got scared and dustin hoffman gives him this whole speech about you know yeah you were scared but you know scared gets a bad rap definitely a bad rap uh yeah i wouldn't want somebody on my team that wasn't a little bit scared cuba gooding jr is like well then i'm your man i guess <laughs> that's a lie yeah and meanwhile cut away to the jungle where marcel just gets caught by a net marcel's been nabbed yes and then we see dustin hoffman and he's at this nighttime garden party where he goes up and confronts morgan freeman and dustin hoffman says oh it's bad it's 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 really really bad wapner's on it four and morgan freeman says you remember how you overacted in Nairobi? You were wrong then. And do you remember about Laza Fever in 1992? You were wrong then. And you come in here smelling like dirty socks in my nighttime garden party? This is not a big deal, Dustin Hoffman. I'm Morgan Freeman. 
we cut to an ocean liner where we see a crew member feeding Marcel the monkey some banana so he don't die. And Marcel's in a cage, by the way. This is why I would never make it through this movie because I'm the asshole feeding the banana to the disease monkey <laughs> down in the hold. And you get a glimpse into this guy's relationship with the monkey and it only becomes more me. Yeah, well, we find out later he was taking selfies with the monkey and then getting them printed. And then he tucks them up under his bed bunk so that when he lays in his bed at night, he can look up at a picture of him and his monkey while he's just spanking it to pictures of him and a monkey that is one of the top five weirdest things to jerk off to is a picture of you and a tiny monkey together i don't want to know the other four <laughs> no the number one would kill you <laughs> We cut to Rene Russo's house where a yellow taxi cab is sitting out front with those two adorable dogs inside. And Rene Russo and Dustin Hoffman, they really get into it over how they once had a really terrible marriage. And it all starts out really passive aggressive and it quickly shifts into aggressive aggressive. And I got a feeling that their pre-divorce fights were the things of legend for their next door neighbors. I think she beat him. I wouldn't doubt it. She's got three inches vertical and two inches horizontal on him. A, a solid 20 pounds, too. <laughs> Not because Rene Russo is a big lady. No. It's just that Dustin Hoffman is such a tiny, tiny man. In Rain Man, he was the little one. Yeah. Tom Cruise is four foot three. And Dustin Hoffman was shorter than him in that movie. And it's not because Tom Cruise was walking around in platforms. I mean, they could be like Russian nesting dolls of each other. So you would go Tom Cruise to Dustin Hoffman to Warwick Davis to Vern Troyer. And then ultimately to... Uh, Plato. <laughs> If a Russian nesting doll with just a lump on its side. <laughs> eh, eh, get to Mars, Quaid. Our show is really targeted to a very specific demographic. If you were born between this year and this year, you get most of our jokes. Everyone else is just confused as shit. 1972 to 1974. If you were born <laughs> in those years, this show is the best show you've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so this scene wraps up though after all this passive aggression leading to aggression but she's just like fuck you dustin hoffman as they're in front of this taxi cab with their dogs and they're just like fuck me fuck you and then this whole scene like shifts tones heavily yeah as they're just like you know what we really had some good times didn't we and they all but kiss and make up and then dustin hoffman's like you remember those bones at the pet store they really like the bones, the medium-sized bones. I'm going to Zaire. Lots of dead bodies. Dead bodies everywhere. And Renee Russo all but sheds a tear, and she's like, you take care of yourself. I'm going to drive off with our dogs now. <laughs> yeah, she's gone. Two different times she ha she tells the cabbie, like, we're good here. Let's go. And then he doesn't because <laughs> I think he just wants to see what's going to happen. I think he felt pretty confident that neither of them had a gun. He would have to because otherwise he could be collateral damage in this fight. <laughs> but finally, after they talk about the bones and stuff, and I, I assume that the taxi driver is like, you know what? I think there's a chance for these crazy kids. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's totally meters running. <laughs> well, but then why not let him, let him keep going? Well, he went as long as he could. And he's like, I, they, she's asked me twice to drive off and I haven't responded. I haven't said a word because this movie is not going to pay an extra <laughs> for the line. You ready to go, lady? She, in theory, has left the movie, leaving Dustin Hoffman to his own devices. And inside the USA MRII DFWQ, Kevin Spacey and and Dustin Hoffman are doing a West Wing style walk and talk about the dogs slash comedy hour while Spacey workshops a little crowd work. This is all supposed to be like charming and endearing for both of these characters. Let me get this straight. Dustin Hoffman, you got the photos and she took all the dogs. Was there a photo of the dog? Because you could have gotten your problem solved all at one time, you know? Hey, you over there in the white lab coat, where are you from? What do you do for a living? I mean, besides being a scientist. Jackass. And we learn that Rene Russo has taken a new job at the CDC in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. As they continue this just absolutely unendurable conversation, Chad, they're prepping these spacesuits, you know, their hazmat suits, and they're about to step in. And then Kevin Spacey is like, hey, Dustin Hoffman, wait a second. 
what's that? And it turns out that Dustin Hoffman has a tear in his suit. And this is actually a pretty nice job that the movie does of landing the idea that one slip, one little tear, and you could be fucking dead. Both. They're prepping their suits with rolls of duct tape. They're just like... Rappity rap, rappity rap. There's a hole in his suit going into a room that is filled with diseases that have no cure. And they decide to remedy this in the same way that you would fix a hole in an oversized shark pool float. It's just kerslap. <laughs> yeah. Let's go in, buddy. Yeah. You know, look, duct tape is a miracle of modern science, Chad. I don't know if you've ever watched Mythbusters at all, but they built everything out of duct tape. And I, for one, am a supporter. I- Inside this lab, Dustin Hoffman and Kevin Spacey and Cuba Gooding Jr., they're all doing science stuff with some samples from Africa. And at one point, Kevin Spacey, (laughs) that prankster, he just tosses a vial of incurable disease over to Cuba Gooding Jr., who naturally shits his pants as it flies through the air. But because he will someday be the greatest football player ever represented by Jerry Maguire, he catches the vial. And then Kevin Spacey says, I can do anything I want because I'm charming and people love me. And I mean, I can do anything. Watch, you'll see. I'm going to do some shit that would send most people to jail. And I'm still going to produce and star in some shitty Bobby Darren biopic. And I'm also going to be in a movie where I play a talking cat directed by Barry Sonnefeld. I'm unstoppable, people. It turns out, Chad, that he did some sleight of hand shit and threw (laughs) Cuba Gooding Jr. an empty vial or something. And meanwhile, he's got the actual, like, Mataba vial. And he says, you got to learn to be quick around here because there's nothing in this room that can't kill you including the air i only point that out because it's supposed to be spooky or whatever but it's not let's just get this out of the way for a movie that is billed as a thriller there is nothing thrilling about this movie it is boring as whale shit it really mistakens suspense for just waiting around for shit to happen <laughs> yeah and when stuff to, or we'll get to it but when stuff does happen it's utterly ridiculous there's more suspense in an episode of Joe Para talks to you compared to this film. <laughs> yeah, you're right. At least in Joe Para, I don't know how it's going to end. Watching this movie, you're like, yeah, I've pretty much I've seen this. There is more like Hitchcockian tension in your average baking show. I thought you were going to say toilet paper commercial. Oh man, don't mention toilet paper right now. I'm fresh (laughs) out, man. I'm scooting on the lawn like a dog. We get some real movie science as each of our experts all explain how the cells in this Petri dish, that they can kill everybody in a matter of hours, destroying all of their internal organs. So if anybody were ever to get this disease in our film, Bo, there would be no turning back. There is no cure for this thing. You get this disease, you are going to die. No cure. Absolutely. Kevin Spacey says, this thing works faster than Ebola. I hate it. Dustin Hoffman says, yeah, yeah, you have to love the simplicity of it. A billionth of human size and it's it's winning. And Spacey says, well, what do you want to do with it? Make out with it or something? And Dustin Hoffman says, nah, kill it. I definitely want to kill it. After they've all left for the day, apparently, sneaky Morgan Freeman. <laughs> dum, 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 dum. He like Scooby Doo's his way into the lab and takes this sample of the Mataba virus. And then he goes to, I don't know, his other secret lab or something Mm -hmm. where he gets them to compare it against the 1967 Mataba virus, which you may recall from a couple of minutes ago was cured with a bomb. Right. It looks like it's the same virus. And Morgan Freeman has one of those, oh my God, kind of moments where he realizes is that this disease has come back to haunt him. Then we move to Morgan Freeman's office and Donald Sutherland comes in and he's like, hey, Morgan Freeman, you remember how we destroyed that entire village and virus and kept it all a secret for about 30 years? I think we should probably keep that up. So if you don't mind, I need you to get Dustin Hoffman off my ass so we can protect this secret. You know, studying all of these microscopic viruses they're so small mostly on a subatomic level and and this means that one tiny atom of this virus under my fingernail could be one tiny universe you know if you're a real film buff you can see my cock 
in Don't Look Now. If you're a real, real film buff, you can see my bare ass in Animal House. And one of my balls. If you're an extra special film buff, you can see a weird puppet of me with a bad wig in Philip Kaufman's Invasion of the Body Snatchers. We cut to another day, and Dustin Hoffman shows up at Morgan Freeman's house, and then Dustin Hoffman says, Well, I'm Alfred Taba. I'm an excellent driver. And Morgan Freeman says, I need you in Mexico. And there are unscrupulous reasons that you cannot know about because of the plot of this film. Leave my office, Dustin Hoffman. I'm Morgan Freeman. Hoffman keeps saying throughout the movie, like, yeah, this is the biggest thing we've ever seen. Definitely the biggest virus we've ever seen. And you're like, what does that get you? Do you get to name it? Uh, Aside from the thrill, I suppose, of discovery, like you've already discovered this new virus. And he's like, yeah, you know, yeah, we definitely need to sequence it. And then we'll be all famous. How? You get famous for curing a disease, not finding one. Hmm. Somebody should tell the current administration about it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but yet, yeah, like you said, Morgan Freeman is just like, how about you go fuck yourself and get to New Mexico? Dustin Hoffman does his signature move of this movie of either storming out of a room or into a room. In this case, he's on his way out. Uh-huh. We then see the cargo ship, the one that trapped Marcel the monkey, and it's pulling into, Bo, the San Francisco Harbor. Then we see this warehouse that's just full of monkeys in cages. Fuck. And Patrick Dempsey is driving a forklift with Marcel the monkey in a cage out on the front. And Patrick Dempsey looks like the lost, lost boy. He's got the mullet and the jacket and the silver earring with like a cross hanging down from it. And I'm sure there's some eyeshadow on there and he clearly has a terrible taste in music yeah there there's a a machines of loving gray song playing in the background and he's like (laughs) you know sleep all day party all night it's fun to be a monkey forklift driver patrick dempsey leaves the monkey warehouse and he's got marcel the monkey in a cage in the back and he pays off this security guard at this bio lab and off he goes so we cut to dustin hoffman and renee russo doing what arguing again but this time over the phone dustin hoffman says hey Rene Russo, you got to sound the alarm at your new job at the CDC. Definitely, definitely sound the alarm. Dustin Hoffman, he gets so frustrated in this call. He says, for once in your life, Rene Russo, you got to, you got to take a chance. And Rene Russo says, I did Dustin Hoffman when I married you. And then she hangs up the phone and we, the audience know this because the movie cuts back to our brilliant scientist, Dustin Hoffman, who is holding the receiver in his hand. And he says, you hung up the phone, didn't you? Definitely, definitely hung up the phone. First it was the dogs, and now we're fighting over a virus. Definitely, definitely the virus. We then find ourselves out in the rural woods of maybe like Northern California, where Patrick Dempsey, he's riding around in Fozzie Bear's Studebaker with this caged monkey in the back seat. Yeah, Sweetums is chasing him. Hey, guys, (laughs) I want to come with you. Moving right along in search of good times and good news with good friends you can't lose this monkey has hiv move right along (laughs) so as they're cruising along marcel the monkey's in the cage and he's drinking water from this baby bottle it's adorable that is until marcel the monkey just spits backwash into patrick dempsey's mouth and patrick dempsey isn't phased one bit I don't think this is the first time he's had a monkey spit on him, Chad. I think it may be the first time he didn't pay for it. Dude, I freak out if my dog licks me anywhere above the elbows or above the knees. Not me, Chad. Uh, When my cats eat, they eat directly from my mouth. I baby bird (laughs) them, Chad, except I lay down on my back. Patrick Dempsey strikes me as the kind of guy who's not beyond picking up a half-smoked camel light off the ground under the guise of waste not, want not. He's one of those assholes that's like, what do you mean you're throwing out half a hamburger? A lot of this lettuce isn't even black and wilted this clearly explains why he's not so put off by giving a half-eaten cookie to a random child later we'll get to that here in a second that's mo- <laughs> one of the best things about this movie so yeah so after he gets spit on by this monkey no he doesn't get spit on he gets spit in the mouth by a monkey <laughs> yeah again This is why I don't make it through this movie if it were a real thing. Because I would let that monkey like throw shit in my mouth and put his hand on my molar and just check it out. Patrick Dempsey then takes Marcel to Rudy's Pet Shop in Cedar Creek, California. Okay. He's trying to basically unload this monkey with Rudy. And Rudy is like, hey, I asked for a male, not a female. You brought me a female monkey. I can't do shit with this. And meanwhile, I'm like, what pet store can you buy a monkey in? And as Rudy is fucking with marcel marcel ends up biting rudy 
uh, like in the finger or something. He's like, ah, get this monkey the fuck out of here. I hate this monkey. And so Patrick Dempsey ends up being like, fine, Rudy, you suck. And then he leaves with Marcel. You also need to know that there's another monkey there, monkey number two, that steals Marcel's banana. And monkey number two eats the banana because monkeys are just genuinely dicks. <laughs> Yeah, but let's face it. If you had a banana and I was hungry, I would try to take part of your banana. That's why you love monkeys so much. I know. I <laughs> so like us, Chad. Renee Russo decides to go to see her new boss at the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, and she goes in and she says, "Hey, look, my ex-husband Dustin Hoffman and I fight nonstop, but I need you to send out a special alert that he brought to my attention." And her boss at the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, is played by Foghorn Leghorn, and I know this because I was getting a beer. Uh, excuse me i was getting another beer during the scene and i couldn't see him but i could only hear him as he said things like i say i say i say do you know how hard it is to send four hundred thousand employees a special alert and renee russo says yeah you just send them an email you type it up and you hit send and then you're like oh wait right this is 1995 none of that shit exists also he's like hey you know there are no chances of this disease reaching the united states it if so help me, I say, if this disease gets to the United States, I will eat my hat. So, Dennis, you are playing the part of the CDC leader. Um, it just it says CDC boss, and it's taking place in Atlanta, Georgia. So I just need you to kind of give me like a nice southern accent and just, you know, just let it go. Just let it go. Give me that and you're going to be great. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> How about a, well, how about we get the monkeys? That's a little bit too much. He's intelligent and sophisticated, but not too much. Uh, oh, uh, like uh, more of a Southern lawyer, you say? Yes. How about uh, something like this? Uh, That's more Louisiana. I'm really thinking more Georgia, if you could go east a little bit. Something more in the Leghorn region. I gotta be honest, it just sounds like you're making places up now. We cut back and we see Patrick Dempsey, and he's just decided to say, fuck it. And he takes Marcel the monkey out in the woods, and just Marcel scampers off, which you're like, "Uh uh-oh, this ain't good. Marcel, very cutely, is like, I don't want to go in the big scary woods. I want to stay here with you in this cage and spit into your mouth some more, because that's what gets me off <laughs> and Dempsey is like no 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 you gotta go like I like that too but I don't like to commit I don't want to be nailed down different spit monkeys and different zip codes that's my motto and he ushers Marcel out <laughs> and into the woods it's time for him to get on a plane yes which he does thank god he's got the row to himself because he does not look well Chad no he does not look well at all yeah he is very sweaty mm-hmm. um, mom spaghetti mm-hmm. so he's eating a cookie takes a bite of this chocolate chip cookie which is in fairness a pretty nice thick looking chocolate chip cookie if you don't mind me saying it did look good and so he takes a bite of it and puts it down because he's like oh i'm too monkey sick to eat this cookie we've all been there <laughs> sure who hasn't been a little monkey sick this kid wanders by this like i don't know like five six year old kid wanders by dressed up like a cowboy yeah and he's like hey mister you gonna eat the rest of that cookie because it looks delicious patrick dempsey is like um no nah, you can have it don't <laughs> worry about the blood coming out of my nose in the corner of this eye and all the sweat just take that cookie and the mother like right before the kid can grab it this mother comes out of nowhere is like what the fuck are you doing and just snatches this kid away and patrick dempsey goes it's all right i don't want any trouble with the law (laughs) i got a good uh story about me as a kid where my mother freaked the fuck out where i did something inappropriate sure one time my family traveled to tampa florida for reasons i won't get into and we went to eat on in this restaurant that was on a boat that sat out in the gulf i'm like in first or second grade and i go to the bathroom to go pee and i'm in there taking a piss and then there's this guy beside me taking a piss and we strike up a conversation you know how you do when you're seven years old and there's an adult beside you and you both have your dicks in your hands (laughs) yeah i'm usually on the other side of that but i get it (laughs) so i'm chatting with this guy and he's from another country and we talk for a few minutes and then the guy says i want to buy you something so i'm seven years old and i'm like this is awesome i love this restaurant so we go outside and there's this tacky gift shop if you can imagine something like that on a floating restaurant out in the gulf right beside tampa florida and i bought this ceramic pelican that this guy bought me and i didn't touch his dick or have to you know put anything on my mouth and so i come back to the table and i sit 
sit down and my mother's there and other people in our group. She's like, where have you been? And I said, I met this guy in the bathroom and he bought me this ceramic pelican at the gift shop and her head exploded. She goes over and I find the guy and he's there with another family and they explain, no, 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 this is Uncle Joe. He's a pedophile and he's very kind, but he didn't rape your son and he can keep the pelican. And I had that pelican for many, many years until one day it was broken. Let me tell you a slightly different story, Chad, about (laughs) Terminal Sundays in my house where our family would take my brother and I to the airport and send us into bathrooms in an effort to get as many gifts as possible. You took my sweet, innocent idea and you found a way to capitalize on that. Kudos to you. Let the free market do its thing. Get rich or die trying, Chad. That's my motto and (laughs) has been ever since I was four. One thing about you, Bo, you have a very wide stance when it comes to public bathrooms. I have a wide stance on a lot of things, Chad. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, Patrick Dempsey shows up at Boston. They, They land in Boston is where the airplane touches down. His girlfriend greets Patrick Dempsey, who is now sweating like the pilot from Airplane. Yes. Just pouring down his face. And his girlfriend sees him and is immediately like, yum, yum, give me some. And... (laughs) just grabs him and starts making out with him it's a nice hollywood open mouth kiss yeah and then only after she has kissed him with tongue is she like hey you seem real sweaty and gross what happened and patrick dempsey is like "Ah, fine and then just he goes down we then cut back to the pet store where what was the guy's name rudy gurner rudy the rabbit so we cut back to the pet store and uh rudy he collapses because remember his hand got scratched by marcel and he falls into all the fish tanks boom down they go and then we cut to this actor playing and an emergency room doctor and he really gives our southern fried head of the cdc performance by foghorn leghorn a real run for its money in winning the most stereotype performance in the movie outbreak because this doctor is just screaming come on rudy thump Come on, Rudy! Thump, thump! Don't you die on me, Rudy! Don't you die! Nurse, 20 cc's, stat! And give me one of those machines that goes, Bing! Rudy, you've got to live, damn you! Live, Rudy! And Rudy doesn't. <laughs> he, he takes that opportunity to die. <laughs> And and then they're like, all right, we got to see what's up with this dude. So they have this guy's blood or a sample of his blood. Not all of it, Chad. That's ridiculous. That's a lot of blood. They just have a little vial of it, Chad. (laughs) They're not vampires. (laughs) No, unfortunately. Although, how much better would this movie be if it were vampires trying to deal with an outbreak and they had to find good blood? That would be a real conflict there. Uh, What I wouldn't give for Vamp Break, the movie. Instead, we got this one. This is my favorite scene in the whole film because they go to this lab and the the movie introduces us to this real dum-dum who's working in the lab and he's listening to sport on the radio and apparently his team has lost and he's like, God damn, I lost a bunch of money or something. While he's being pissed off about his team losing he reaches over and puts his hand into this centrifuge that has all of these glass vials of blood spinning around at i don't know a hundred rpms and he just puts his fingers in there glass shatters spraying infected blood everywhere blood goes in his mouth in his eyes up his nose it is fantastic it's a real splatter uh picture there it's a real jackson pollock of viri that this guy gets And he immediately, as as you would, he goes to a doctor and he's like, holy shit, am I okay? And the doctor's like, you're fine. It's Rudy's doctor, the one who is beating his chest until he dies. And he's real casual about this at this point. He's just like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Everybody gets blood in their eyes. It's fine. He's wiping down his face bow with a rag like he's the corner man in a boxing match. Like he's his mom. And, you know, he got a little schmutz on his cheek. He's just dabbing it with his tongue. And, well, let's get me. You're about to go meet your great aunt now. When she's gonna smell weird but just get used to that you're gonna be fine there's no need to worry about anything you're not gonna give your girlfriend hepatitis you're not gonna give her aids just go buy her some flowers and you two will be just fine get out of here your mommy's little man okay (laughs) right just pats him on his ass on his way out you You go give that girlfriend of yours something nice (laughs) like a horrible african virus that just turns her insights to shit you just get on out of here 
cowboy. Rene Russo's back at her job and she's walking and talking with some other researchers and she gets handed some papers that are about Patrick Dempsey and his girlfriend being in the hospital in Boston. And Rene Russo, she reads them and her eyes get great big and she just runs off to go investigate. And she says, give me a flight to Boston. We cut back to Patrick Dempsey and his girlfriend who are who are in these plastic Mormon tents where they're separated from each other with plastic. Uh-huh. Patrick Dempsey is just bleeding out his eyes and nose and he's he's bleeding out of his every <laughs> yeah he's just again turning into liquid shit at this point and Rene Russo has shown up in in Boston and she says hey Patrick Dempsey wake up were you in <laughs> contact with any animals and instead of answering Chad what he does is dies <laughs> Right. And then Rene Russo is like, oh shit. All right. Uh, who, oh yeah. Her. Okay. Hey, hey, um, you're bleeding out your face too. Patrick Dempsey's girlfriend. Do you know if he was in contact with any animals? And then she just starts screaming. <laughs> He's just like, I don't want to die. And you're like, I get it. I get it. Uh, that would be my reaction too. Mm-hmm. And so Rene Russo is not getting any information out of these two because one is dead and one is well on her way. Right. So she and the one doctor who agrees to do an autopsy because everybody else is like, I'm not fucking touching that body. Yeah. Dr. Parkinson. Um, who later discovers a disease and in, uh, in the sequel in Outbreak 2. He comes in holding the scalpel and he's shaking all over the place. And Rene Russo is like, she's like, out of the way. Oh cut this son of a bitch open and she splits him open and again the movie just cheats on us and doesn't show us anything we just sort of see this blurry reflection off of her face mask and i'm like this is an r-rated movie give us something yeah i get that the imagination's better than what you're going to show us but you're not showing us anything you know what was great the end of raiders of the lost ark when their heads melted i want to see what this looks like yeah even spielberg eventually showed the shark in jaws you don't see shit in this movie you don't like people bleeding out the corners of their eyes is as gory as this movie gets and that's unfortunate bunch of pleated khaki pants and it's a bunch of hollywood liberal bullshit chad that's what it is <laughs> then she calls dustin hoffman because she's like you know it's been a while since i've had a really good argument she's like hey patrick dempsey just died he was working in this animal biotesting place or whatever and the what i can tell you <laughs> is that the incubation period is super short dustin hoffman says yeah that's good definitely good if it spreads fast and it, the incubation short because that means we'll know how and where it's spreading real quick and Rene russo is like hey that's real optimistic for you you know and he goes yeah yeah i'm i'm an optimist because i i still have hopes for us we're divorced we are never getting back together get that through your tiny head can I just call you one time without this turning into vague sexual harassment and we just talk to each other like professionals instead of you saying you want to get in my pants yet again? We then cut to the most unrealistic moment in this entire film. But kind of the most famous, right? Like uh, when you think of this movie, this is kind of the scene that I think most people think of. Maybe. What's most unbelievable about it is that we're outside of a movie theater and it's showing the 1972 Peter Bogdanovich film, What's Up? doc starring barbara streisand and ryan o'neill and there's a line around the corner waiting to get in no fucking way even when that movie premiered people did not line up for what's up doc those people in line are were thinking they're about to go see a warner brothers cartoon there's no way they were going to go see that or a porn it was like what's up doc and see you next tuesday <laughs> But it's it's the scene where this the lab tech who got all the blood on his face. Yeah, centrifuge guy. Yeah, whose doctor was like, you're fine. Take your girl to the movies. Here's $20. Bring back the change if there is any. I need you to go to the movies. After that, take her to a bar. The next day, I want you to take her to a public beach. Also, if there's a curfew, <laughs> ignore it. You know, hey, you only live once, kid. I saw in the paper there's a coughing convention in town. Uh, he goes in the movie theater and and you see him sneeze and he doesn't cover his mouth or anything because he's a philistine and a bunch of just phlegm and particulates start floating around uh-huh including into one lady's mouth yeah notably mm -hmm. yeah that's when it got sexy chad <laughs> what's up doc sometimes yeah i like to blow some viruses right in a lady's mouth you know what i'm saying chad <laughs> you know you know chad
All right. The centrifuge guy, he's hacking and coughing, so he gets up to leave the theater because you know what? He's polite in some ways, not so uh, much in others. And he walks out into the lobby and he's just hacking and coughing on everybody. And everybody's looking at me like, what the fuck kind of asshole is this? And he goes up to the concession stand. He's like, I need some water. And then he just collapses and falls on the ground and just violently starts shaking like someone screamed alligator at a toga party. (laughs) That's my second Animal House reference for the episode so far. Well done. Yeah. And and then he just goes into a seizure and then we cut away from that for an adorable scene of marcel the monkey eating a pine cone <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't serve any purpose other than to remind you that there is a monkey out there in the world that can kill everyone <laughs> right that is the cause of all this problem but that's it that's it. that's it for the marcel scene and then we go back to the doctor the the small town doctor talking to this <laughs> lab tech and he's like hey you're sicker than shit no doubt about it but good news we caught it early <laughs> And so what we need you to do here, pal, is we need you to fight. Can you fight for me? As he's delivering this bogus speech, somebody else in the lobby of the this healthcare center just starts having a seizure in the lobby. Uh-huh. And then the camera turns around and patients are coming in from everywhere, like the, from the four corners. It's pretty much the set of any emergency room on any CBS hospital drama that your mom makes you watch when you visit. Right. Well, not my mom because she's dead and not your mom because she's dead. Mm-hmm. Both of them. We're missing a lot, Bo, with all this CBS hospital drama because of our dead moms. We're not missing anything. The the good news is, Chad, that I had one of mine stuffed, and uh, she just now sits on the couch with a remote in her hand, always tuned to CBS, America's Most Watched Network. It is my own personal tribute to uh, film Psycho and the American folk hero, Ed Gein. I'm so happy you didn't say Lars and the real girl. That's that's in the other room. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> mom i'm in here you told me you would not i put the sock on the door for a reason mom renee russo is in the virus command center at the cdc with all of her virus nerds and they get a fax that says that there's an outbreak in cedar creek and that's where this hospital is and all this chaos is happening and then dustin hoffman goes into morgan freeman's office and morgan freeman is standing there in his jammies he looks adorable it's a sweet robe and then these two argue about whether dustin hoffman should be part of a civilian effort where Rene Russo is now taking over command as her new job at the CDC. And push comes to shove and Morgan Freeman says, you do what I tell you to do or else you will be sorry. I am your boss. I realize that my jammies make me look less threatening, but I still have power over you. Remember, I'm Morgan Freeman. And then Dustin Hoffman pulls his signature move and leaves in a huff because Morgan Freeman says, hey, you're off the case. Beat it, jackass. Dustin Hoffman immediately goes to the airfield where there's a guy whose job it is, I suppose, to hand out the keys to planes or something. This is so stupid. Yeah, where he's like, hey, I need the, our flight isn't going to New Mexico anymore. It's going to Cedar Creek. It becomes this whole like who's on first thing. Yeah, it's this con job. Yeah, where the guy's like, hey, sir, I got to call and get off authorization look uh you you call and get authorization your your ass will be on the line definitely definitely on the line you need to send me down to cedar creek or sunnyvale or grover's corners yeah yeah definitely grover's corners don't call anybody don't don't put your finger on the button and the guy's like oh sir i'm gonna lose all my stripes in my bars and he's like definitely definitely don't do that definitely just put me on the plane and don't ask any questions definitely <laughs> oh if only they were going to sunnyvale chad dustin hoffman is pulling this con job on the airfield morgan freeman has shed his slick ass robe and really comfy pajamas which i was real jealous of Mm -hmm. he's gotten rid of those and he's now you know in his hazmat suit uh, of his own and he opens up a super secret vault where he removes e1101 this like plasma or something this serum in a plastic bag right and he calls donald sutherland and he's like hey donald sutherland do you know why evil plan to have this horrible virus well It looks like Dustin Hoffman's going to find us out. Also, we've got a breakout of uh, the deadly Metaba virus that we covered up. Remember that when I just said it? And we need to do a media blackout to keep the whole uh, of the country from panicking and from this disease to stop spreading. I'm Morgan Freeman. If this outbreak is real and it gets out of control, we have only one option. Blow up the whole town. Obliterate everything. That's how every Michael Crichton novel on bookshelves everywhere handles this type of situation. Congo, Jurassic Park, Sphere, Andromeda Strain. 
The Great Train Robbery, maybe not The Great Train Robbery. That's a different type of novel, and I should know. I, I starred in the movie adaptation of that with Sean Connery and Leslie Ann Down. She was quite the looker. Still is, if you ask me. And a little behind the scenes here, Chad. <laughs> We discussed at one point potentially doing the movie Contagion. Mm -hmm. And I made the argument, Contagion is way too good a movie for this show. Right. I stand by that. One of the reasons is because the next scene in this movie is the military invading the town of Cedar Creek. And for the rest of the movie, it kind of becomes a movie about how the military is this overbearing authoritarian weapon that is poised to do more harm to its citizens than good. And that's really <laughs> putting lipstick on a pig. Yes, it is. But in reality, the movie Contagion is very very much about how people in a situation where there is a disease running rampant uh, across the world behave in unpredictable and often self-defeating ways. That's hard to imagine, Bo. I was just going to say, if you want to watch a movie that can kind of give you that worst case scenario of how... Turn on CNN? It's, it's that, but in the future. Like, Contagion <laughs> is the United States in three months. Yeah, and this movie, the closest you get to it is, fuck this shit, man. Head to the woods. Dude, th that is the best part of this movie. So, <laughs> But anyway, so the military just rolls into Cedar Creek as a bunch of citizens of this town are just watching, like, Humvees and tanks and shit roll down the street street and the military surrounds the city and and basically they have formed a military blockade to quarantine the small town of cedar creek right helicopters are flying in the air renee russo and her team of nameless researchers show up in their marty mcfly yellow jumpsuits in this small town there's a whole bunch of rural folk screaming and yelling at the authorities a lot of their comments are clearly first amendment and second amendment related issues there's a lot of this is unconstitutional Constitutional. You can't do this. I studied the Constitution. I've spent 12 years getting a master's and a PhD in constitutional law. You cannot do this, shithead. <laughs> yeah, I've been in, in, <laughs> in high school for eight years, Lloyd. I'm no dummy. It's a lot of that. And so she gets to City Hall, I think, or whatever, uh -huh. where she's greeted by our small town doctor who's like, hey, Rene Russo, this is just a small town where everybody knows each other and everybody's scared. And Rene Russo's, by the way, look at this thing on my belly. Should I see a doctor about this? Hey, get to Mars. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you got a quado and this is not what we're here for today. <laughs> That's more of a, an elective surgery at this point is quad removal. A quadectomy is what we call it. <laughs> that ain't happening anytime soon. No, 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 no. We, we got to use these beds and intubators uh, for other purposes. I don't care how many quados you've got. <laughs> I got four. That's a quad quado. We've got to do a quadruple quadectomy. <laughs> you better hope your health insurance is good for that shit. That will bankrupt a family. I had just had a double quadectomy and that put me on my back for almost six months. My goal is to make it to where when you search quadruple quadectomy... <laughs> Our website will be the number one thing that shows up. Ladies and gentlemen, be sure you are searching quadruple quadectomy. Hashtag quadruple <laughs> quadectomy. Let's, let's get this trending. Um, Rene Russo is wandering through City Hall. And who's there but Dustin Hoffman? And Rene Russo says, I thought Morgan Freeman sent you to Mexico. And Dustin Hoffman says, he did. He did send me to Mexico. Definitely. Ten minutes to Wapner. <laughs> yeah, and she's like, oh, maybe there's something dangerous about him that I didn't see in the years we were married or whatever. You know, I'm discovering things about him. There's still mystery in our relationship. No, there's not. No, there. this is just one facet of the same old bullshit that you've seen before, Rene Russo. I'm on her side in this movie. Everybody in our movie who is sick in this makeshift hospital, it's everybody from the movie theater because that guy was coughing and they all sucked up his germs. And then some hospital worker comes out and... And gets Dustin Hoffman and says, hey, you need to come see this guy. He was in a car accident and he didn't have nothing to do with this uh, movie theater uh, nonsense that's going on. He's been here a week, but he's got all these gross sores on his face. And then Dustin Hoffman goes in and he has a light bulb moment and he says, it's airborne. Definitely, definitely airborne. It takes him a little too long for him to be a top scientist to come to this conclusion. Lisa needs braces. <laughs> It is. It's a channel plan where he's just staring at this guy and he's just like, wait a second. 
if he's been here for two weeks and that vent is blowing on his face. Hmm. Wait a minute. Orderly, where does this vent connect to? Well, that one, sir? Yes. <laughs> well, it connects to that room with all of those dying people from the movie theater. Does it? Huh. Someone get me a piece of paper and a pen. Does anyone have a dry erase board and a marker? I need you to run down to City Hall and get the blueprints for this building right now. I need to see the schematics. It needs to include all sewers, vents, every exit. I know there's a hidden door here somewhere. Is there an it clown in this city that I need to know about? <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's just stupid <laughs> so while he's putting together that like oh this has gone airborne now morgan freeman shows up <laughs> here i am in cedar creek morgan freeman and the guy who trained tom hanks and saving private ryan who is called briggs in this movie he's uh whatever is below a general a corporal or whatever he is he says morgan freeman we have the town locked down and morgan freeman says look if you see dustin hoffman I want you to arrest him immediately. I know your first instinct is going to be to praise his acting in several classic films. But what I want you to do <laughs> is take him into custody. Forget about The Graduate. Forget about his remarkable turn in an otherwise disappointing movie called Dick Tracy. I need you to arrest him. I'm Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Dustin Hoffman and Rene Russo step out into the streets and everybody's losing their ever loving minds. Yeah. It's like, this is bullshit. You can't come in here. I got rights. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't protect me from a virus. You son of a bitch. I got something I want to introduce you to. It's called the 12th amendment. Ch -ch -ch. I'm about to infect you with an ass whipping. And <laughs> so they go to this mobile lab where uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. has identified this second strain of the M Motaba virus, which is the airborne one. There's the original virus, and then there's this new virus that has spikes or something. I don't know. Just keep rolling. <laughs> And just keep going. There's a lot of that in this movie. Just forget about it. Just keep going. It's also during the scene that Kevin Spacey, he spouts off this theory that he was like, maybe the host animal has both strains of the disease. And you're like, yeah, that sounds good. And then Rene Russo chimes in. Oh, by the way, the dead guy worked at a pet store. And Dustin Hoffman says, we should definitely, definitely go there. I bet the host animal's definitely in the pet store. And you know what else? I think that the host animal probably has antibodies for both of the strains. I don't know if that's true. True or not. I don't know much of anything, but it seems strange that the host of this disease would also carry something that's like the antidote. Probably carries the antidote. Wait, what? He's got the diseases in him, but the cure is in the monkey too? They do not explain this nearly well enough or at all, but they, they just kind of mention it. There's a lot of these like leaps of logic, like, oh, well, if there was another animal in the pet store. That animal had to be the host animal, and it had to have two different diseases. You know, like two different variations of the same disease. Also, while we're at it, I think he was probably into calligraphy, weirdly. And so there's a lot of that shit of just like, we're just riffing on the plot of this movie. There are a couple of things that they kind of skim over. One of them is this, of uh, we don't know what the animal is, but we're pretty sure if we get it, it's going to have built up some immunity to the viruses it's carrying and therefore the animals antibodies can be used to fight the disease and others and i just explained it way better than the movie ever does because it doesn't explain it at all look here's how i can explain it to the real dumb dums of the world the disease is in the monkey and the cure is in the monkey right we got to go find the monkey that's it so Hoffman takes a uh, Humvee out of town where he goes to find Morgan Freeman to tell him that, yeah, it's airborne, definitely an airborne virus now. And Morgan Freeman is like, well, that's impossible. I actually have seen this virus about 30 years ago. Oops. I didn't mean to tell you that, Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> uh, but... Hoffman says, "Like, hey, if you don't if you don't believe it's airborne, definitely go check the hospital for yourself." He has a pretty good line here where he says, "And definitely don't wear a mask, and you'll find out more clearly for yourself." <laughs> yeah, that is a pretty good line. <laughs> and Morgan Freeman is like, "Believe me, it's under control. We made a recommendation that everyone stay home, and I'm pretty sure they're doing that." <laughs> And yeah, uh -huh. go turn on the news. You'll see how well that's going. Right. And meanwhile, you know, the residents of Cedar Creek, California are like, man, whatever happens, happens. We're just out here looking to party some. I think we're going to be pretty good. I don't think this Mataba is going to take a, take hold or anything. I think I think it's probably a, a hoax of some kind or at least overblown for sure. I, I've seen more people following the please don't pee in the pool sign. <laughs> 
than what we're seeing in this film. Yeah, notice there is no V in our virus. Please keep it that way. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a bunch of hillbillies roaming the streets, and, and Dustin Hoffman is like, hey, nobody's staying home. Everybody is out. Like, you know, me and Rene Russo almost definitely got killed trying to get out of there. And Morgan Freeman says, look, you were never here. This is another one of those moments where I'm like, I don't understand what's going on in this dialogue. Because Morgan Freeman tells Dustin Hoffman, you were never here. And then Dustin Hoffman's response is, I've always been here, Billy. And I'm like, what? I think they were lovers once upon a time. Look, before you met Rene Russo, you were a tender and giving lover. I don't know that I've ever got, gotten over that. Yeah, Bill Clinton's president. Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> so after his spooky, I've always been here, Billy, uh, response, we cut to a reporter who summarizes the movie so far, uh -huh. which this movie does on a couple of occasions. Yeah, just start it here. If you ever watch this film, it'll save you a lot of time. Yeah, you're at about the 57 minute mark, and that's really where you want to be in this movie. <laughs> And so a reporter, uh, after they summarize this, some military choppers then chase away the news helicopter. Get out of here, you. <laughs> yeah, it's a real, yeah, you want uh, it. Rene Russo and her gal pal scientist go to Rudy's where they find a sick monkey, a.k.a. monkey number two. Right. And they're like, look, this isn't the host because this monkey is sicker than shit, which doesn't bear out because there ought to have been more monkey diarrhea in that cage. <laughs> like, if I'm the production designer of Outbreak Chad, this movie gets a lot more details right <laughs> one of them and most importantly is the amount of monkey poo and or semen that you would see among all the monkeys shown in this film all right everybody gather around gather around i'm gonna teach you the tricks of the trade <laughs> if you want to make accurate looking monkey diarrhea you do not want to start from the ground up simple shortcut you need to take a 16 ounce can of campbell's beef chunky home style stew Put it into a blender. Blend it once, twice, thrice on puree. Pour it into the bottom of the cage. And it looks as authentic as any monkey shit you will ever see. Positive note is that after the film shooting, you can scoop it up, heat it up, and eat it up. You are all welcome. If I give you one... Dickie, the Monkey Man Taylor hint. It's that if you want to make the monkey look even more sick... What you do is you shake up a bottle of Yoo-Hoo, you mix that in with your stew, makes it no less edible. Let me tell you that right now. But it will turn a stomach or two in that theater, and I think that's what we're all here for. If your monkey wrangler does not show up and you need your monkey to lay down and be docile, let me give you a helpful hint. Just ply him with alcohol. I'm not saying you need it in this movie, but if you want to see these two monkeys box... With cute little gloves. We can make that happen in no less than 17 minutes. I have timed it. If you need a monkey to spit in your mouth. Oh, that's already in the script? Well, <laughs> I, I gotta be honest. I did not read that far, nor did I expect it. But we can deliver. I can have these monkeys spit, shit, or piss anything, anywhere. And when I say anything, anywhere, it is true I got a bonobo to piss Hershey syrup onto June Carter Cash. That is a true story. I have got the, the eight millimeter film to prove it. It is more rare than the day the clown cried. But I have both of those films and I often double feature them. Back in Grover's Corners or wherever the hell we are, all, right. all of our be multitude citizens, they get in their pickup trucks and their Ford Broncos and they grab their guns and they just decide to get the hell out of town. And we get a really nice car chase that doesn't belong in this movie at all and the army shows up and chases them around and our hillbillies decide to just make a run for it and they say we got to get to the trees because that's what they learned from et <laughs> and then as the small town folk are zipping away they are just like openly fired upon by this military helicopter and then these like military trucks and to make a long story short they just blow the fuck out of this ford bronco after one guy leans out the window and takes a couple of pot shots and they're and like the military guys are like damn it why did they have to shoot at us? And to be honest, I'm glad they shot at us because I blew up their car. This is my favorite moment in the movie, Chad. Is it when the military comes over and arrests mom and no. dad and the other two kids? It is the trio of mannequins oh. used right before the explosion in this truck. Uh -huh. Namely, the one in the middle that has its arm held up. Ah! 
It, it, it's that, but the shot goes on too long so that it is so clearly a mannequin. One of my favorite things in any movie is when a mannequin is blown up and or thrown off a cliff. What was better, the mannequin burning in this car or the mannequin that got blowed up in Firestarter when they were at the farmhouse? This one is clearer than that one. I okay. Look, I watched this scene about 17 times. Because I was cackling at the look of this man. <laughs> it was easily the most entertained I was ever uh, in in any moment in any scene in this movie. That mannequin brought me more pure joy than anything else. And this movie is rotten with monkeys. I don't know that it's worth the two hours and eight minutes, no less, of this movie. Which this movie could be an hour forty easy. Is it still bringing you joy right now? The movie, no. The mannequin, 100%. Well, you're welcome. In the next scene, Cuba Gooding Jr., he does some science stuff on some samples from monkey number two, and they decide that he is not the host monkey. And then the military sets up all these mash units, and they also take over the streets of the city, and they really start threatening the people that if they're outside of their homes, they're going to be arrested. So all these citizens return back to their homes, and Dustin Hoffman comes outside, and he sees a truck delivering cases of these plastic IV bags full of E-1101, our mystery liquid that Morgan Freeman procured earlier. Earlier. And Dustin Hoffman goes in and he confronts Morgan Freeman and he says, what's in E-1101? Definitely, definitely E-1101. And Morgan Freeman says, it's an experimental serum. I want to save these people the same as you, Dustin Hoffman. We have to work together, you and I, because I'm Morgan Freeman. He takes a bag, Hoffman does, of this E-1101, swipes it, and he gives it to uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. And he's like, yeah, definitely try this on that sick monkey we got. And uh, also see if you can figure out what this is. Yeah, definitely figure out what it is. Meanwhile, Chad, we get a little interlude in this movie, which is the story of Patient 612. Yes. Where we see, you know, soldiers rolling through the town, and one of them's got uh, a megaphone. If you feel sick... We need you to put a white sheet out in front of your house and the army will come and take you to a secure facility where you will be euthanized. I, I mean, immunized. We guarantee that you will not get any more sick than you already are when you go with us, the military. All of your symptoms will immediately cease to exist once you come with us. All of your coughing will stop. Your sneezing will stop. Aches, fever, breathing, they will all stop. Consciousness, it will stop. Wait, what? This thing's on? By the way, red sheets mean you're fucking. We will not come into your house if a red sheet is on the door. <laughs> our, our rule is, as the military, if the red sheets a flapping we won't come a slapping it's still a work in progress anyway white sheet is sick red sheets sex just an fyi yellow sheet means you're still pissing the bed <laughs> it's not something to be ashamed of a lot of us did it including johnson over here shut up you told him you'd never say anything about it i was crossing my fingers also he did it well into his teen years his parents took him to a child psychologist because they thought he might be a serial killer. Isn't that right, Johnson? <laughs> it was because my dad hit me. It's not because I was a serial killer. Shut up. Quit talking into that megaphone. Also, we're pretty sure he was being diddled by his father, which is, of course, a euphemism for molestation. Now, a lot of times, <laughs> urinating the bed is a byproduct of that kind of trauma. So, Johnson, you shouldn't necessarily feel bad about it. It was really inevitable. Hey, please, stop talking. Uh, anyway. Please stop talking. Yellow sheets, you're pissing the sheets like Johnson. Red sheets fucking, white sheets sick. So I shared that with you in confidence. Well, I probably should have focused more on the white sheets. Johnson, I swear to God, if you interrupt me one more time. So... Patient 612, can you come with us? Leave your husband and your cute children. Don't hug them. Come with us. Patient 612, the mom of these two daughters, she's played by Michelle Joyner, and she was the woman that Sylvester Stallone dropped at the beginning of Cliffhanger. 
Yeah, they should have dropped her from this movie. That's the kind of stupid stuff you learn on our podcast. Look, edutainment. Uh, we've said it a number of times. We are edutainment. So Kevin Spacey is checking slides in, in the midst of this interlude. And they're all numbered, so he's like, patient 610. Damn it. Infected. <laughs> patient 611. Son of a bitch. Infected. Patient 612. God, da, 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 da. <laughs> Infected. <laughs> And so all the, these sick people are taken either to the elementary school or these tents where, as you pointed out, they're just like, you are definitely going to be fine. Don't <laughs> don't feel like we are sequestering all the dead next to this burning pit for any reason. Oh, did I call you the dead? We need all of you to get on this bus. We're taking you up to a farm upstate <laughs> where you're all going to be able to run and play in the open fields and enjoy the sunshine for the rest of your lives. You'll all be just fine. <laughs> so we leave the saga of Patient 612 at easy 10 minutes you can cut out of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> she don't matter. No, you never see her again, Chad. After she gets to the concentration camp that's it she's done we're j oh god i hate this movie so much and then <laughs> dustin hoffman <laughs> is on the phone with the warehouse getting back to the real movie he's like hey warehouse uh you you definitely have an animal that was that was sick and and caused this virus and they're like hey we we don't have no monkey like the one you're talking about the only thing that's really horrific about this scene is that kevin spacey is wearing sandals in it like a monster chad <laughs> Just socks and sandals and scrubs. It's disgusting. And on his way out, childish Dustin Hoffman is so pissed off about not knowing where this monkey is. He just throws his coffee on the, <laughs> the dry erase board that has like all the, here's the diagram of who got the disease and gave it to who and whatnot. And you know, Kevin Spacey, he just had to be like, hey man, I gotta, I gotta draw all that back now. Because it's not like we don't need that information. You're just being a child. Right. Speaking of Kevin Spacey, we're about to get him the fuck out of this movie. He's uh, doing some some work in uh, you know a high-toxicity environment. He's so sleepy. I was up all night just you know imagining young men who were intoxicated. And next thing I know, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. My dick's in my hand. And the sheets are covered in goo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's disgusting. He's got one of those like coiled air tubes attached to his suit and it gets hung on the edge of a desk. And as he's walking, essentially the tube gets caught and yanks his suit, which tears it. Yeah. And as soon as he sees this, he's like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. And just unhooks himself, runs out of the room, and sits down to hide the fact that, you know, he he tore his pants. Yeah, he's gonna die. <laughs> yeah, and Rene Russo comes in and is like, hey, you ran out of the room really fast. Is everything okay? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. Everything's real fine. <laughs> um, You know, I just had a case of the Willies. <laughs> it was such a weird name. They shouldn't call even call the Willies. They, they should call it the Sam, which is your husband's name. You know how weird he is sometimes? Anyway, no, I'm fine. It's cool. Um, So I'm gonna get back to work, and you look great. Did you lose weight? Doesn't matter. You look great, and uh, everything's good. Everything, I'm good. You're good. Everything's good. Talk to you later. We cut to the White House, and Donald Sutherland is holding a briefing where he shows the estimated growth rate of this virus across the United States. And he's like, here's how it spreads in one hour, four hours, eight hours, 48 hours. The whole country is infected, and everyone in America is dead. <laughs> yeah, that, that is quick. It goes from zero to 100 just like that. And then Donald Sutherland, he whispers to the group, we must be compassionate, but compassionate globally. I've just read some intelligent research in Michael Crichton's latest novel, Disclosure, which explores sexual harassment, where it's the man who is being sexually harassed. And I think we can all agree here, except for you, Diane, this is a real problem that we'll have to deal with at a later date. But in the meantime, we all need to agree to blow up this small town with a very large bomb. Eternal bad guy in a rare good guy turn, J.T. Walsh, shows up as the whatever to the president. He's uncredited in this movie. He's the chief of staff. He gets up and he's like, so I like a virus with hairy arms. 
<laughs> I like a virus with a big bush. <laughs> yeah. You know what I like about... Anyway. Um, so he... <laughs> J.T. Walsh, as the chief of staff, I suppose. He explains how a bomb works. It's real wily Coyote stuff. But he has... Uh, I kind of like this speech where he's like, look... If we're going to blow up this town, every single person at this table is going to stand up beside the president and say there was no other alternative. Not me. You are going to marry yourself to this. I'm not doing and that. If, there, if there is anyone here that thinks we shouldn't do this, That's me. you say, Jim, I swear to fucking God, <laughs> I let you in because you are my wife's cousin. If you fuck up this presidency for me, I'm going to divorce your sister, and then I'm going to sue the shit I out of you. I have video of you with a prostitute. Jim, you're doing a bang-up job. Yeah, so he says, uh, you know, like, he throws the pictures of, like, the victims of, of the virus on the table. And he says, look at these. These faces ought to be burning in your brains until we die. I, I like it. It's, it's sort of him saying, like... We are making such a terrible decision. None of us should ever sleep good again. We cut back to Smallville, USA, and the military is just piling up bodies in body bags inside this barn. And they're stacked as high as an elephant's eye. And then the military just sets the barn on fire and burns them all up. And that had to smell bad. I mean, all that plastic and human hair. I've smelled worse. And so Marcel, the monkey, shows up at this little girl's window. Uh, he taps on the window and peeks at her while she's sleeping at night. Marcel's a pervert. Honestly, it might as well be Kevin Spacey in a monkey suit. Just hanging out on a branch outside a kid's window. Just, yeah, look at her sleep. And then Don Sutherland arrives in Cedar Creek. There is nothing else to say about this scene. It's just him showing up and being like, guess who's here? The bad guy. Right. The villain of your movie has arrived, everyone. Then we cut over to uh, Morgan Freeman, who greets Donald Sutherland. They have this discussion about the flu epidemic of, of 1918. And Morgan Freeman is posing the question, like, if there were men who could have stopped this horrible influenza epidemic and didn't, what would history say about those men? I'm Morgan Freeman. Sutherland is like, you know, Billy? <laughs> I like how everyone calls him Billy in this movie. Morgan Freeman. He, uh, but he's like, Billy, you know, there's a long uh, history of uh, leaders who have been vilified for their behavior. Uh, you know, rewriting history for Truman dropping the bomb, saying uh, he did it uh, not to save lives, but to show the Russians what we had. Burn. I want, I want to watch it all burn. Yeah, he, he says, by the way, I've got the go ahead to burn everything. You, me, the entire city, whatever I want, really. The president has given me a green light for Operation Screaming Citizens of the United States. Well, you know, I think maybe that sounds a little aggressive. Have you considered a different title for your operation? <laughs> I guess we could call it Operation Clean Sweep. Yes, that's much better. Sounds more like you're maybe doing some spring cleaning is all, and I think maybe that's the way to go. And Don Sutherland has a line here where he says, you know, Billy, I'd give all those people in that town a medal if I could, but we can't let this virus escape. And I like the idea of 2,618 people lined up with Donald Sutherland just like, well, here's your medal. All right. What's it? But Barry, all right. Here's your medal. And uh, who are you? Oh, Susie. Well, you're, how old are you now? Seven? Well, well, here's your medal. Now, the best part of this is that each of you will receive a sack with $10,000 inside. And on the outside, there'll be a large dollar sign. We know that you all enjoy sacks of money because you're Americans. And the way we're going to deliver this is in a giant bomb-shaped package that will gently glide down from the sky attached to a parachute. And when it hits the ground, your sack will be there waiting for you with your name on it. Whoever is closest to this money bomb, I mean package, uh, <laughs> will get the most money. So the closer you are to where it, it lands and detonates, I mean opens up, the better off you're going to be. So Rudy Russo and Dustin Hoffman are now talking about how they're stuck. They got, they've got they uh, got no leads on finding this monkey. Right. They're talking about the fucking dogs again. And I'm about to fall asleep for the third time watching this movie. Mm -hmm. When he notices, hey, that monkey number two, the one that was sick, is up and about now. Yeah. And then in a wild series of deductions... <laughs> 
Dustin Hoffman says, yeah, yeah, that was definitely a serum designed specifically for African Matabo and not the new strain of Matabo. So it's definitely a response to the original strain, and they definitely knew about it. And there's definitely a bioweapon. And also, <laughs> what's going on with Kevin Spacey over there? He's definitely passing out. <laughs> Yeah, he hits the ground like a sack of potatoes and he starts going into spasm. And Spacey, as they're taking him into the hospital, he's kind of still cracking jokes and he's kind of pretending to be Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. And during his convulsions, he's still capable of insulting Dustin Hoffman's intellect. During this time, he kind of spazzes out so much so that it causes Rene Russo, who's trying to draw blood from him or something, to stab herself with a syringe that's full of Kevin Spacey's blood. So now Rene Russo and Kevin Spacey are both infected and they're going to die. Rene Russo runs into the other room and squirts her hand with some cleaning fluid and Dustin Hoffman runs in. And he's like, he's like, yeah, let me see your hand. Let me see it. You need to put some iodine on it. And Rene Russo just screams like, I did. God damn it. Dustin Hoffman, stop. There's nothing to do here. I'm going to die. And then Dustin Hoffman, he caresses her 180 degree see-through face mask on her hazmat suit. And he says, yeah, there's definitely something we could say here. Kmart sucks. He didn't really say that. And he doesn't say the Kmart sucks part, but he does say, yeah, there's definitely something to say. And then doesn't say anything. And again, I'm like, the fuck is everybody talking about? <laughs> like, I don't understand. Half of these scenes that we've talked about end with a line that I'm like, I don't know what they're, they mean by this. It's just bad writing. After the scene with Rene Russo, Dustin Hoffman races over to Morgan Freeman's office where he accuses him of knowing about the Metabo virus. Right. Morgan Freeman is like, well, there comes a time in every doctor soldier's life where he has to stop being a doctor. Stop being a soldier. Yeah. You knew this whole time, didn't you? Yeah. The whole time you knew. And now my wife is dying. Yeah. And Freeman's like, don't you mean your ex-wife? You are, after all, divorced. Unless, of course, you're Catholic and feel that you will forever be married in the eyes of God. You know, I played God in two motion pictures, and I narrated a series about the history of God. You can see it on Netflix. I'm Morgan Freeman. I've got a quick question for you, Chad, a, a quick uh -huh. hypothetical. If you were uh, a practicing Catholic, for example, and believed that no matter how what, what any legal document says, you are married until death do us part. Right. But you're also a flatliner, Chad. And so you get Julia Roberts to kill you for a few minutes, and then you come back from that. Ooh. Are you off the hook for that marriage? Hey, father, father, I got a question. <laughs> can God make a rock so big you can't pick it up? Ah! I'm just saying, like, you, you could turn flatlining into a less creepy profession and more of a Catholic adjacent divorce attorney situation. I think you're on a slippery slope because what few Catholics I know well enough to really give me the inside skinny their whole take on when life begins i got a feeling that the opposite side of that coin of when life ends is going to be equally as squishy yeah little made up i i see what you're saying all right well anyway dustin hoffman does his trademark move in this film of 23 skidooing right out of this tent humph <laughs> thump 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 so he gets a, a call dustin hoffman gets a call on the sat phone in his jeep from Cuba Gooding Jr., who says, Jerry, I got ants. <laughs> That's not what he says. Show me the money, Dustin Hoffman. Nah, he, he, in fact, he's talking about the uh, interrogations that were going on, probably illegally, at this biotest company. The Quan. That's what I want, the Quan. I haven't seen Jerry Maguire in at least 15 years. Is any of this coming back to you? A little bit, and it makes me remember that I don't think he's the best part of Jerry Maguire. And it also <laughs> makes me wonder, what are the good parts of Jerry Maguire? <laughs> During this call, Cooper Gooding Jr. says, hey, yeah, they did a shakedown on the security guard and he was paid off by Patrick Dempsey and Dempsey smuggled a small animal out of the facility. It was tiny enough to fit in the back of his car and it came from Africa. There's so much left. We got to get through this. After they get that confession, they do find out that th there was a ship that it had to have come in on. Right. And Dustin Hoffman tells Cuba Gooding Jr. to pack his shit so they can go find out where this boat is. But then Don 
Donald Sutherland tells, what was the old guy's name? Briggs. Yeah. So Donald Sutherland tells Briggs, hey, if you see Dustin Hoffman, you got to arrest him. And then Dustin Hoffman and Cuba Gooding Jr., they're like, hey, we got to get out of here. Let's go steal a helicopter. And Dustin Hoffman says, hold a minute. I got to go tell Rene Russo something real quick. He says, hey, Rene Russo, if you're not showing symptoms by 1800 tomorrow, you definitely need to get out of this town. Wink, wink. Get out of this town. Wink, wink. And she's like, what are you talking about? Wink, wink. Why are you winking? Is something going to happen? Wink, wink. Is it worse than a virus? Yes. Is it? Is it a tornado? Just definitely, definitely get out of here. It's if by 1800 hours. Why 1800? Why can't I just do this in the morning? Yeah, they're def- Look, they're going to bomb the whole city. What? <laughs> why didn't you just say that? <laughs> Why did we have to play Ring Around the Rosie with this? They go outside and they just steal a helicopter. As they're taking off in the helicopter, or as they're about to steal it, we have to establish that Cuba Gooding Jr. is a pilot. So the movie stops dead for Dustin Hoffman to say, hey, how much flight training have you had? And Cuba Gooding Jr. says, 60 hours of flight training, all practical. And But the way he puts it is all yanking and banking, which is what I call, Chad, masturbating in a racquetball court. Then MP show up and they're like, hey, where's Dustin Hoffman and his pal? And Rene Russo is like, oh, is he a big guy? I don't know. And and yeah, then they steal a helicopter and leave. This helicopter takes off and then it lands on some like city county government building and Dustin Hoffman and Cooper Gooding Jr. They run inside and they're say like, hey, we need the manifest and the, the ships of landing from all the cargo ships that have come into port. And Dustin Hoffman and Cuba Gooding Jr. They get these printouts after they pull a lot of like, we're from the city that's infected and you're going to get our AIDS or something. And so everybody freaks out and they give them these pieces of paper and they're comparing manifests and they realize, hey, here's the ship that might be the source of this illness. But that ship has already sailed out of harbor. And there's this elderly female clerk who looks like your grandmother's bridge partner <laughs> yeah. and this old lady says i've got a friend with the coast guard that i could call and then dustin hoffman says yeah how close a friend is he how, how how close of a friend and this old lady says he's closer than his wife wants him to be and i'm like this old lady is bragging about it she's fucking some married yeah. guy in the coast guard yeah finally something's interesting in this movie chad i want a movie about her life starting yeah. at age 14 till present day that's gonna be an amazing story filled with all kinds of surprising debauchery i like how completely unashamed she is to be like i'm fucking a married man what of it i let him do it in my butt like why are you saying this out loud oh the spark went out on his marriage a long time ago and i will do things that she never even considered <laughs> why well, i just get myself in a corset and i bend right over and oh, hey 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 <laughs> we just need to to know where this boat is it's not just him it's him his friends he's got all manner of straps and objects i don't care i take six quaaludes and just turn my body into a wonderland for him so they find out where this ship is so off these two scamper to get back in their helicopter to fly out over the bay so that they can get close enough so that dustin hoffman can jump off the helicopter onto this ship yeah in what is the most action-packed scene of the movie so far is dustin hoffman's stuntman trip falling onto a boat it's really ridiculous. Also intercut with this scene, we have a moment where we see the little girl, the one that lives in that house that Marcel the monkey likes to visit late at night to watch her sleep. And this little girl is drawing a picture of herself with her nighttime monkey creepo visiting her, you know, peeking through the window. And like viruses, like stink lines coming off of it. And this is my diseased monkey friend, mom. We also get to see that Rene Russo is starting to show symptoms of the illness because she's not not wearing any makeup we go back to the ship with all the cargo and our action movie hero dustin hoffman he's yakking it up with the crew that doesn't speak any english but then they somehow understand sort of what he's talking about when he uses the word doctor so they take him down to this freezer where the guy who initially trapped marcel the monkey well he's now dead and they've just left him frozen in the walk-in and then dustin hoffman says he wants to go visit this guy's bunk and this is where he sees the picture of the guy and the monkey the one that 
Bo hypothesized that he masturbates to at night. It's the best girl position of like the pictures that you have in the bunk, like tucked into the mattress above you. The only pictures that you have there are pictures of things you are going to masturbate to. I guess so. Dustin Hoffman looks at this picture and he's like, hey, bingo, bango. I like bananas. Eek, eek. And so <laughs> Hoffman knows that this is the monkey that they're looking for. Renee Russo, who's looking more and more rough every time we see her, she goes over and visits Kevin Spacey, who looks terrible. And it's here Kevin Spacey dies, but not before telling Renee Russo that she needs to be nice to Dustin Hoffman. Thanks a lot, Kevin Spacey. Yeah. So we go back and Cuba Gooding Jr. is now flying the helicopter with Dustin Hoffman back inside. Don't worry about how he got off the ship back in the helicopter. This is one of those, like, don't worry about it moments in the script where Dustin Hoffman, when he jumps on the ship, he's like, hey, Cuba Gooding Jr., how are you ever going to land on this ship? He's like, uh, tell him to clean some shit off when you get on the boat. Magic. Just clean it off. <laughs> They don't speak English, jackass. Right. They barely understood the word doctor. Cuba Gooding Jr. has Dustin Hoffman in his helicopter. So where do they go next? They fly over to a TV station and the two of them barge in with guns drawn and they just take over the news broadcast. Dustin Hoffman steps in front of the camera and holds up the photo of the dead guy and his jerk off monkey. And he's like, yeah, this is the monkey that we're looking for. We don't have the virus, but we're looking for this monkey. Definitely, definitely looking for this monkey. He's the same monkey on the TV show Friends. If you know where this monkey is, please let us know. At the exact same time as fate would have it, the mother of the little girl, where Marcel the monkey comes to visit late at night, she's watching TV. Then she looks at this crudely drawn crayon scribble marking that her daughter made of her and this monkey. And I got to tell you, man, it don't look like a monkey at all. It's a real how many fingers does Mrs. Claus have kind of picture. It looks more like the Babadook than it does a monkey. And... <laughs> This mom deduces, hey, that's the monkey on TV. So she calls up the CDC. So Dustin Hoffman and Cuba Gooding Jr. jump back in the helicopter and race off to rural California to capture this monkey. But aren't they going to be blowing up the city of Grover's Corners at 1800 hours? Like what time is it? right now more importantly chad when did it become cdc policy to forward phone calls to wanted army fugitives <laughs> okay you know those guys who stole a helicopter and then illegally boarded this vessel and then broke into a new studio and hijacked their broadcast <laughs> and then fled the scene as cops fired shotguns at them i think i know the two guys you're talking about but keep going yeah but the whole plan is just like hey uh, definitely call this number if you see a monkey that looks like this the cdc gets the phone call and they're just like you know who needs to know this those two assholes who broke into a news studio and put our number on national television. Let me tell you how this phone call is really going to go. Dustin Hoffman's going to answer the phone and go, yeah, yeah. Have you seen the monkey? And all he's going to hear is Baba Booey, Baba Booey, Howard Stern's big penis. I don't think it even gets that far. I think it goes to the them getting a phone call at the CDC, not the, the CDC getting the phone call. And the mother saying... Hey, uh, I think my daughter has a plague monkey in the backyard. And they're like, mm -hmm. we got one. I think it's more of a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. plague monkey, you say? Okay. And uh, how long has she been playing with the monkey? A mm -hmm. couple of days. Okay. All right. Well, uh, do you have any photos of her with the monkey or photos of the monkey that we could compare against the photo that he showed on television? <laughs> um, I'll tell you what. We're going to put uh, some of our uh, our top men on this. Well, who are you going to put on it? Our top men. Crumple, crumple, kathunk. Yeah, this goes into the round file cabinet beside my desk. Um, yeah, no, this this goes nowhere <laughs> after they show up on television. That is where, in a in the real world, this movie stops. Foe, we have a race against time. We have to figure this out before 1800 hours. I think it's today or tomorrow or next week. Six o'clock is 1800 hours if my math is right. And that uh -huh. is when he told Rene Russo to leave. The bomb's not actually dropping until eight o'clock. Okay, got it. So that's Pacific. <laughs> that's Pacific time. That's 11 o'clock Eastern. That's late for me. It, it's late for- I gotta get up and go to work tomorrow. Not if a bomb drops on you, you don't. <laughs>
<laughs> That's a permanent vacation, Chad, just like that Aerosmith album. They're charting. They do get a, a phone call where the mother calls in and is like, hey, I got a plague monkey. And so the CDC calls Dustin Hoffman and Kubi Gooding Jr. And they're like, hey, were you looking for a plague monkey? And they're like, yeah, yeah, definitely need a monkey. And they're like, hey, we got a call from this mother in the Palisades. Dustin Hoffman then summarizes the movie where it's like, oh, well, the monkey came over on a boat. And then Patrick Dempsey took it to this pet store. And the pet store didn't want the monkey. So he, before getting on a plane to Boston. Who is this for, Bo, in the theater? I don't like, watching know. Watching this, like, are these for people that showed up 45 minutes late? We know what the hell's going on. Those people who show up early to the next showing, but just sit down and watch the end of the movie anyway. What a bunch of freaks those people are. What the fuck is going on? Do you read the last page of the book you start first too? You maniac. <laughs> then Briggs has, brings Sutherland. Briggs is, you know, the mustachioed um, underling of Donald Sutherland. Brings him a note that says, hey, Dustin Hoffman and Cuba Gooding Jr. are on their way to find this monkey that they've been alerted to. And Don Sutherland says, and who do you think should be handling this now? And <laughs> Briggs says, you, sir. And Donald Sutherland says, you know, Briggs, you kiss ass with the best of them. Do you want to make general someday? And he says, well, yes, sir. And Don Sutherland says, well, you won't. And then leaves. It's like, what is this sick army bird about? Like, what does he have against Briggs? Uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions. There's a lot of lines in this movie that just leave me scratching my head. But all right, so Dustin Hoffman and Cuba Gooding Jr. finally arrive at the monkey house. Dustin Hoffman watches out the window while Cuba Gooding Jr. like hides in the trees with a trank gun at the ready. And right. the little girl says the monkey will only come to her. So she goes out there with like a bowl of apples and starts making hideous sounds like beep, 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 beep. Come on, monkey. Beep, beep, beep. Dustin Hoffman essentially uses this little girl as bait to catch this monkey the same way Jack Nicholson used that little girl to catch the pedophile in the pledge. And considering this monkey's habit of watching this child at night it's not a theory that's you know beyond comprehension to lure this monkey in with this other child if the pledge were about jack nicholson hunting a monkey <laughs> that had killed his daughter uh -huh. that would be the greatest movie of all time <laughs> <laughs> replace david morse in the pledge like change nothing else about the movie right just put a guy in a gorilla costume or something <laughs> not no you use this monkey this little marcel monkey drunk behind the wheel of a car that he can't reach the pedals of right and they runs over a girl and then nicholson goes on the hunt that'd be good it would be great uh everyone should watch the movie the pledge it's a really good movie and it, and it's gonna make you feel good oh that's the thing. That's the thing about the pledge is that movie will put a smile on your face that'll last for days. He's lying to you. <laughs> it's it's as depressing as every Sean Penn movie. So the little girl, she's outside making her eek eek ook ook noises, <laughs> and Cuba Gooding Jr. is there holding this trank gun. And then finally, Marcel the monkey shows up. And because Cuba Gooding Jr. is not only a medical scientist, helicopter pilot, and crack shot with a gun, he shoots Marcel the monkey. And this extended sequence of boredom finally comes to an end. And off they scamper with the monkey. They they take all back to cedar creek sutherland meanwhile is like hey i need a good pilot with uh with a, a chopper of my own a helicopter of my own to go intercept dustin hoffman and kubi gooding jr with this monkey i'll do it sir i'm Iceman. so dustin hoffman finally once they're in the air and they've got this monkey he calls morgan freeman and he says hey we have the host animal yeah, we definitely got the monkey. And Morgan Freeman says, you need to get back to Cedar Creek quickly then and safely. There are some helicopters coming to shoot you out of the sky. You may run into some resistance on your way back, Dustin Hoffman. I'm Morgan Freeman. Then Morgan Freeman calls the plane what has the bomb and tells them to stand down. Yeah, they're on a plane called the Sandman. Which is, I suppose, uh, a bit of a, a euphemism for, you know, murdering a city. I guess. Here comes the Sandman putting everybody to sleep, Chad. Maybe it's like the Apollo Theater. Like, Sandman! Sandman! 
Get out here and get all these people out of this city. And just sweeping right. all the people out of Cedar Creek. <laughs> then the army choppers, what one of them has uh, Sutherland uh, on board. They see the smaller helicopter stolen by Dustin Hoffman <laughs> and Cuba Gooding Jr. Because the, And they found them because there's this radar plane that was scrambled so that it, it's keeping an eye on uh, on their helicopter. On the, the Don't none of this matter. It's a pointless helicopter chase sequence. There's a moment where Dustin Hoffman, who has not interacted with Donald Sutherland one time in this movie so far, uh -uh. W because when Donald Sutherland g gets on the radio and is like, hello, am I talking to Dustin Hoffman? And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm so glad you called. Guess what? <laughs> I found the plague monkey. And Donald Sutherland is like, uh-huh, I'm going to need you to turn around and turn yourself in. And he's like, um, yeah, definitely fuck you. So at that point, Don Sutherland is like, okay, you need to shoot them out of the sky. Right. And then we just have a bunch of helicopters fly around for a while. They do a loop-de-loop -loop at one point, don't they? It's not a loop-de-loop. -loop. They go kind of straight up. And then come back down at an angle. It's not a, a complete 180, but it is, it's a helicopter trick, I guess. Why is there a helicopter chase sequence? During this chase, um, Dustin Hoffman and Cuba Gooding Jr., they fire a couple of missiles off into the woods and it's a, like a decoy. So our bad guys chase after the explosion and our good guys get away and they land in Grover's corners and they go in and they're like, yeah, definitely extract some monkey juice from Marcel the monkey and it's going to help save everybody's life like we're in a batman movie or something this doesn't make any damn sense at all <laughs> right we're just gonna throw this monkey in a blender and then give the juice to whoever needs it i suppose they're like mix up this monkey juice with e1101 definitely definitely just start plugging it into people and that'll bring them back to life like what are you talking about recent news experience chad <laughs> has told me this is not how vaccines work that from the point of hey we know basically the genetic sequence of this disease it's going to be about 18 months before we got something that works <laughs> and in this case it's about 18 minutes yeah because dustin hoffman goes into renee russo's room and he's like yeah we definitely got the monkey got the monkey renee russo is like uh that's great but i'm gonna die soon and so dustin hoffman takes off his own mask stupid right she's like what the fuck are you doing dumbass and he's like yeah now we're definitely in the same boat see see i'm i'm so confident that we're gonna get this vaccine working i'm i'm putting myself in mortal danger mortal danger Rene Russo is like, do you know how vaccines work? It's not going to work. That takes months, years sometimes. You're going to mix up monkey juice with this experimental serum and you think that's going to make everybody better? You're an idiot. But meanwhile, Cuba Gooding Jr. rushes in and is like, hey, I squeezed the monkey juice. It's like he whipped up some Nestle quick. <laughs> yeah, not, not since Ovaltine has a concoction been so easy and delicious. <laughs> and then he hooks up this, you know, monkey juice to Renee Russo. Hashtag monkey juice, by the way. It hooks it up to her and then doesn't often squeezes it into her veins like it's wine and they're playing Charty McDennis. <laughs> and then doesn't hold me as like, yeah, definitely make some more. This is good shit. Donald Sutherland shows back up in the movie. Like, they realize they've been had. The wreckage in the woods or the smoke and fire in the woods was not, in fact, the helicopter. Well, one of the guys is like, uh, sir, we've been decoyed. Huh. Well, you got me this time, Dustin Hoffman. But next time, the game is mine. Morgan Freeman then tells Donald Sutherland, uh, like, hey, by the way, we can actually save people now, Donald Sutherland. And Donald Sutherland is like, um, how about you go fuck yourself, Morgan Freeman? A uh, clean sweep is back on. It's a real Crimson Tide moment of two military officials having a dick measuring contest. And you know that the guys in the plane are like, man, this is the problem with upper management. There is such poor <laughs> communication. What do we get? Take off and land. Take off and land. Take off and land. I mean... Are we dropping a bomb or what? And so Rene Russo, it turns out, is actually getting better. But Cuba Gooding Jr. is like, um, I know that our monkey juice is working, but the plane to, that is dropping the bomb on this city is in the air now and we got to go. 
Mm-hmm. So they grab their stolen helicopter again. Again. Then it turns out, Chad, in another super stupid moment in this movie, that there is a secret channel that pilots use to talk to each other on the radio that they start using. Right. Everybody knows that. But then it's not even secret because they hear it at the tent where Donald Sutherland and Morgan Freeman are hanging out. Well, right. Everybody knows it. So it's not a secret. <laughs> it is the open secret of like... <laughs> David Hasselhoff might be an alcoholic. So I don't know why I use that example. But so Dustin Hoffman keeps telling Cuba Gooding repeatedly, oh, they're going to drop this bomb because they want their weapon. And you're like, oh, right. There was something about a biological weapon that is also not explained very well in this movie. No. So Donald Sutherland has confirmed the orders. And then Dustin Hoffman starts talking directly to the pilots where he's like, you know, yeah, you got to abort definitely got to abort because we've got the the serum and if you blow up the city you're definitely going to blow up the chance of saving people's lives definitely definitely got to stop got to stop now before it's too late syrup is on the table after the pancakes and it's definitely too late as he's pleading with these pilots and morgan freeman then develops a conscience in this scenario and that's kind of his character is that he's in theory torn between you know duty and humanity and whatnot listen to me dustin hoffman you must get out of the way of the sandman if you and cuba gooding jr do not get out of the path of this bomber because If you're in the way of the bomber, then the bomber cannot complete its mission. You stay in the flight path of the bomber. It definitely cannot complete its mission, and we definitely wouldn't want that to happen. Wink, wink. I'm Morgan Freeman. And the best line delivery of the entire movie happens here, where Donald Sutherland just jumps into the frame and says, Hey, Billy, wait a second. Are you dumb or something? You just told him how to stop. Wait a second. It's a real like, I see what you're doing here, Morgan Freeman, and I don't like it. But what's a more suspenseful ending? The ending of this movie or the ending of Apollo 13? I mean, Apollo 13 actually builds tension and you care about the characters. But you know that everybody lives. Yeah, but you kind of know that in this movie too, because it's just not a ballsy enough movie to kill everybody at the end of it like it's fucking threads or something. Well, the bomber comes in and it gets closer and closer to the helicopter and the whole time dustin hoffman is going come on guys veer off course definitely definitely veer off course don't blow up the town and the bomber comes in it veers off course the helicopter kind of flip-flops in the wind in the air and you're like oh okay they they didn't blow up the town but then the camera cuts back and the bomb comes out of the back of the plane and it's got its parachute and you're just like oh this town is about to get fucked up and then as the bomb comes down it just lands in the ocean kablamo and everybody is saved yeah supposedly there's a cut of this movie where they actually did blow up the town but test audiences didn't like that ending where all the innocent people died and you know look this ain't body snatchers people okay this is the 90s where you needed happy endings it's not the 70s where you could kill your hero and show that life isn't fair this is the era of bill clinton and don't stop believing and oval office oral sex and the dot-com boom and all that shit yeah this whole movie is just garbage i mean we're at the dead ass end of this movie let's talk about how shitty it really really ends because back at army hq morgan freeman suddenly exerts his power and authority over donald sutherland and he says i've got a higher rank over you or something donald sutherland i'm going to have you arrested for withholding information from the president of the united states um what was the other guy's name briggs well he's like briggs When you're sitting in your Chevy and your pants are feeling heavy. (laughs) Arrest Donald Sutherland and then go clean yourself. I'm Morgan Freeman. When you (laughs) jump into a flip, Corporal Briggs, and you feel something drip, that's diarrhea. So, because this movie is way too long already, let's just abruptly end the film. Because Dustin Hoffman goes in to visit Renee Russo in her hospital room. And Renee Russo is looking better. And then Dustin Hoffman and she just sort of reconcile a little bit. And then Dustin Hoffman ends the movie by saying, yeah, so would you go through all of this again? Definitely, definitely go through it all over again. And Renee Russo says, well, now that I have the antidote, 
fade out the end. Yeah, that's it. And end of movie, thankfully. <sighs> The thing is, people are watching this movie a ton right now. Uh huh. Because they think they're all going to die. And maybe this has some clues on how to stay alive. Yeah. Like they're using it for a handy reference guide or something. But <laughs> as we've kind of said throughout this discussion, there's nothing really exciting about this movie. It's incredibly dull. And when it's not being dull, it also, the leaps of logic that this movie takes are just unforgivable. You know, it, it's the Pixar thing of like, uh, if a coincidence gets somebody into trouble, it's fine. But coincidence getting someone out of trouble is too convenient. But that's all this movie is, is convenient coincidences happening to the main character so that they can get out of the scrape that they're in. Wrapped around huge leaps of illogical conclusions. Like I said, there's this whole bioweapon subplot that is not resolved in any way, nor is it deeply explored. I mean, just who the fuck knows? How are they going to explain that barn full of corpses? That were burned to the ground. I, you know, to me, that is more explainable than something like, oh, like Dustin Hoffman and Cuba Gooding Jr. are still going to have to answer for the fact that they stole a military helicopter, fired missiles into the side of a fucking mountain for no good reason because they were being pursued by the proper authorities. Dude, they hijacked a local TV news program. Yeah, I mean, that's FCC problems right there. <laughs> you got the <laughs> army court martial to deal with. Plus, yes, you have saved lives. You're probably going to get off a little bit easier. But you are 100% going to be standing before a judge in the next 12 months. You know, something that, that they also didn't address, Marcel the monkey still has the virus in him. He's still, if he scratches somebody, bites somebody, they're going to maybe die unless they get more monkey juice. Trust me, that monkey did not make it out of that hospital alive. No. No. That, that monkey was in a garbage bag and tossed in an incinerator. <laughs> Before that little girl could ask, hey, what did you do with my monkey? We got you a dog, and his name is Greg. <laughs> oh, now there's a real happy ending, Chad. Big golden retriever named Greg. Bo, how about you give us an even happier, happier ending, and tell us what's coming up on episode two of season 11 of Pick 6 Movies. We're all gonna die! Well, this is the hap, hap, happiest coincidence of all, Chad. Uh-huh. Because it is the hap, hap, happening the M. Night Shyamalan, <laughs> Mark Wahlberg, killer plant film. All right, so this will be Mr. Wahlberg's second appearance on Pick 6 Movie. Yo, bro, I'm a science teacher in this. It's it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, I'm wearing glasses and everything. I look smart as shit. So come back and see us in two weeks' time, assuming that you're not dead, and we will be bringing you a brand new episode where we will make light of very serious issues to hopefully get you through a very difficult time. So as always, like, rate, review, send us an email, picksixmovies at gmail.com. Bo, any final thoughts on Outbreak? Uh, no, I mean, if you want to watch the good version of this movie, it's called Contagion. You should watch that film. It's disturbing for sure, especially given the current state of things. But it's a really good movie. Steven Soderbergh did a great job with that film. Uh, Jude Law is, is fantastic and, and disgusting in it in a, in a wonderful way. You, no one should ever watch the movie Outbreak. It is the stupid multiplicity version of Contagion that you keep in the basement. I can't add anything else to that. Yo, bro, while you're in quarantine, you better stay away from the phones. They're going to make you kill yourself. <laughs> Wash your hands, don't touch your face. In fact, wash your hands and don't touch any part of your body, all right? Yeah, especially if you're yanking and banking. <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks, everybody.